Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, welcome uh, everybody who is here with us today and everybody who's joining us on Zoom today. We're so happy to have you here for the Women's Financial Estate Planning uh, and Retirement Planning Forum. My name is Amy Lewis. I'm privileged to be the Director of Philanthropy here for Hospice and Community Care. And as part of the mission of Hospice and the reason why we have these programs is we are committed uh, to improving all aspects of end of life, including um, things that benefit the patient and the family, and even after uh, the patient has died, to make sure that the family is taken care of. So we have seen many, many times firsthand the benefit and peace of mind of not only having a sound estate and healthcare plan, but also sharing those plans with your loved ones. We encourage you to take um, all of the steps that are going to be uh, presented here today from our, our fabulous panel to make sure that your plans uh, can be a reality. So today's program is going to be presented by members of Hospice and Community Care's Planned Giving Council. These women are not only local experts in their field, but they also volunteer their time for hospice and have gener generously donated their time to be with us today. Thank you, ladies. Um, a full biography and contact information for these ladies are in each of your packet, uh, should you find yourself needing additional professional support after this uh, program. Please join me today in welcoming our speakers. With us is Kim Carter Patterson with Patterson Law, Sarah Young Fisher with RKL Wealth Management, and Kelly Track with Morgan Stanley. Today's programs um, also wouldn't happen without the support of our hospice staff members. Uh, also joining us and taking all of your questions on Zoom today is Drew Baker <laughs> uh, and Patricia Cochran greeted you and helped prepare the great breakfast that we had this morning. Just as a reminder too, for our friends that are on Zoom, uh, please use the question and answer Q&A box on the bottom of your screen to answer questions. Today's program is going to be entirely guided by the questions that are in the room and the questions that come through our Zoom uh, panel. Without further ado, I think that we should get started and I'll pass the microphone to Kelly Trent. Thank you, ladies. Well, good morning and welcome. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, this is yeah. one of our favorite hospice get togethers. I mean, who who wouldn't enjoy getting together with a bunch of women and eating breakfast and talking about financial estate yeah. planning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually, if, if you like this forum, um, I would encourage you to look into um, joining our Women's Giving Circle, um, where we um, make decisions on, on how to spend our money for the benefit of hospice. Um, but Going forward, um, what we're going to do is uh, Kim and Sarah and I are going to try to answer your questions um, that that you propose to us. And uh, we always uh, cringe a little bit when Amy calls us experts. Um, we certainly have all been in our fields for many years. Um, but if there's something that we don't feel confident, you know, in answering, we'll certainly tell you that. Also, um, we'll try not to get into details about specific issues. You know, we'll, we'll um, address uh, your questions on a broad basis. And if you would like to talk with one of us after um, the seminar, um, you'll have our contact information on how, how to reach us. Um, we'll have a short break at 1030, um, just a, a potty break. I think they're going to leave the food out though, if you. Um, wish to have more delicious quiche um, and this is going to be very comfortable and casual so if, if you need to get up during um, the seminar feel free um, the bathrooms are right around the corner here to the right more coffee and, and juice and tea in the back okay so we're going to take your questions kim's going to categorize them up here on um, the board um, we have some categories that often often come up that and we'll see if how it falls and the questions you answer determines you know what we'll talk about this morning um, so who would like to start 
<laughs> Nobody. <laughs> you have to have an attorney to have a will. Yeah. I'm interested in investment strategies. Okay. Throughout retirement or just well managing stuff. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like um annuities and IRAs and contracts <clears throat> and how it all can grow together. Okay. More aggressive growth, perhaps, than um, investment than, than where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, did you use the, the red marker? I, yeah, I that, that does not, not show up either. That is correct. That <laughs> might be <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Else. Can we talk about um, long term care insurance and HSAs and uh, spending for your medical care post retirement? Okay. All right. That's a big topic. Retirement. <laughs> long term care, HSAs, and medical expense planning. Right. Right. I feel the difference between a financial planner and a financial advisor, but there is a difference in how you go about. Finding one that you know you feel you trust. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Who's next? We have any questions on yours? Go ahead. Are you able to speak to um, trust the the revocable trust and and I just find that all very confusing and the benefit of the, the, the protection of your assets. Mm -hmm. um, protecting your or providing for your heirs. Sure. Yeah. this follows with what she was saying that spend down uh, for nursing expenses for Medicaid purposes. Okay. okay. I sort of put that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's planning. Planning. yeah. Any online questions, Steve? Not yet. Yeah. No. Okay. I have another question. Mm -hmm. These are relatively, it's a relatively new concept. Um, home equity conversion mortgages and the difference between that and a regular home, a line of credit. Like um, reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgage. Well, they're called HECOs. They're home equity conversion mortgages. And they're very, it's very new. It's a very new concept. So if you're not familiar with it, I'm not surprised because I'm not, I'm not either. I'm used to a HELOC, which is the line of credit. Right. It's different. Or a reverse mortgage. It's different. Yeah. What was that again? Home equity? Home equity conversion, conversion mortgage. They're called HECOs. And they are new. I have never heard of them, but I don't know much about them, but that's okay. <laughs> it's basically a, a spend down so that when you pass penniless, that's kind of the goal. And since I have no children, I have no reason to care about who I would leave money to or leaving money to anyone. Mm -hmm. I am all about spending it on me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they, the reverse mortgage, <laughs> the reverse mortgage <laughs> is the government. Takes <laughs> right. But well, it's, who runs so, that? But you it's different it's than a reverse mortgage. mortgage. <laughs> who is who, what is the firm that keep has the house at the end? That would be my question. Is it they? Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. Is it a new name for the same thing? You take the equity that's in your house now, and it can be. I, I don't. I can't answer your questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't answer because I don't know, and I'm interested in finding out more about it. Yeah. So we've got two questions online. The first is: Please add to the long-term care discussion the smart life plan that is frequently advertised. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the second is: Can you address? Basics in planning as a widow for the future. I am still working at age 58, widowed for five years. 
My husband was the main breadwinner, but I am now supporting my home. I feel like I don't know where to start with planning for the future, other than at this point thinking I may have to work forever. Cool. <laughs> um, could we also talk about what would be best for when to take your social security, whether necessary earlier or later? Um, and then I'd also like to talk about retirement planning and how much money you need <laughs> to retire. <laughs> softball, softball. My daughter who plays softball would say there's nothing soft about softball. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Anything else before we get to ready? And then I could we also talk about the role of an executor of an estate and kind of what that responsibility looks like and what if there are more than one executor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you're one of the multiple no. executives. <laughs> oh, I have two I sisters. Have question as well. How does the executor differ from a trustee? And another question online is you begin retirement and no longer are working and generating income. How do you determine how much of your savings in your 401k and other investments you should be drawing down each year? I draw that it's more like um, what, how much do we, the percentage that you can take out of your investments each year, okay. I think, say. I get that like from a CLA, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask, adding on to that, the required distribution, the, the age. R &D. The mm -hmm. age. When you need to take it, how it's calculated, how much, and right. mm -hmm. so that's a very good question. Yeah. 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 Put, with the RMD, put QCD so we can yeah. talk about that. Yeah, Amy. Can we also talk a little bit about uh, tax advantages since to making charitable gifts, particularly through your IRA or your uh, retirement account, but also. Other tips that you might have for. Um, I put QCDs in the yeah. All right. So we'll put tax Guys didn't ask any questions at the beginning. I thought, oh, what are we going to talk about? We got plenty. I know. It always works. It always works. Great. We're all women, right? <laughs> well, we have a lot to go on. Any other questions before we get started? Yes. Is it best for me, I'll be 60 this month. For someone like me, would it be best for me to keep putting money in my 403B through my job, or should I decrease that amount and start stashing more money into a Roth IRA? Or a non-qualified plan, just into your savings or into an investment or account, right. something like that. Yes. Or... I remember yeah. having that conversation with my father. Oh, I have, I can put 15, he's a teacher, I can put 15% of my salary into a 403B. And then he's 80 years old. Every time he takes the chips any out of it, he growls because he has a yeah, tax on. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're earning, when you're putting the money aside and saving taxes, it's a great deal, but then you have to take it out. You don't want to pay the tax. Uh, nobody's allowed to show my daughter my handwriting. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'll just get started um, to answer your question on um, what the difference between an advisor and a planner is and, and how to select one. Um, so a financial advisor manages your money and helps you, um, you know, decide how it's to be invested based on your risk tolerance and how long you have um, 
to live, for the money to work for you, et cetera. And, you know, we'll get into some of the details about investing and answering your questions. But a financial planner can be a separate person who does just financial planning, maybe doesn't do any investing, um, or it can be Sarah and I are both financial advisors and CFPs, certified financial planners. So we incorporate the planning with the investing. Um, and we often say the best way to find um, a financial advisor is through someone you know, someone who's pleased with who they're working with and um, that you should also talk to more than one person. You know, and, and it, you have, it's, you know, a relationship that you're hopefully going to have for a long period of time. So you need to feel comfortable with that person. And um, you certainly can do research on them online. You know, we both have websites that you can look at, you know, as other people do. Um, there's um, something called um, a U4 that we have to provide information when we do a financial plan that would tell you if we had ever been sued or anything you know of that sort so we can do that type of research um i don't think either of us have thank <laughs> <laughs> so what's it called a u4 yeah um yeah we provide a report that's called an adv which gives you more information than you'll, you'd ever want oh, to know okay. about it tells us it tells it, people where it went to high school. Yes, oh, yeah, it's yeah. 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 elementary school. Wow, right? That's, right? Yeah. But, but it tells yeah. you everything yeah. about my education, how long I've been in business, how long Kelly's been doing it, etc. As well as information about our firms. What about fee structures and things like that for an advisor versus a planner? But also, what what would be expected as far as the fee structure? Is it okay to ask those questions when you're looking for a new advisor? Sure. Oh, yeah. certainly, Ooh. certainly, yeah. <laughs> Well, like, some, like my firm, it's free for free for a financial plan. If we have your money, we are investing your money, and and, and I'm sure that's how Morgan Stanley is too. But if you just do a plan, then it might be twenty five hundred dollars or whatever. So it's a difference of when you come in. Do you want somebody to take care of your money for you to take care of your investments, answer, answer all the questions you've had, or do you just want to have? I'm 35, 45 years old, and I, I need to know how much to put aside for the next 30 years. So um, that's the question that I would ask in the beginning. What do you really, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Uh, how important is it for an advisor or planner to be a fiduciary? And also, um, can you go to a, a planner or an advisor just to say, here's what I have, am I doing okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't want anything any further. You just want to have them look at your assets or whatever and mm -hmm. am i okay or <laughs> yeah <laughs> start, start my sign out <laughs> yeah certainly i mean and that's a, that's a way to to check out an advisor mm -hmm. as well um, and, um what was your first question <laughs> <Fiduciary. Fiduciary. laughs> oh, yeah. yeah so um we we are definitely fiduciaries on you know 99 percent of the assets we manage for clients as i'm sure you are i'm 100 percent yeah the fiduciary means that i by law, I have to put you first. Mm -hmm. And so there's some things that other advisors don't have that because they have, they do brokerage things and some other things. But fiduciary means that, that by law, I have to put, Kelly has to put you first, as it should be, right? Mm -hmm. And so we might have a small IRA that um, isn't going to be what we call fee-based in a fiduciary account, for, you know, maybe for, you know, a, a child or, um, something and <clears throat> so we'll have that in in brokerage because you know we're probably going to put that in um, maybe a few mutual funds or we could do it in a fee based model that has mutual funds. But um, this this all came about several years ago and it and the difference was it seems like really semantics. I mean we always said hopefully we were always doing what was best for our client um, and in the brokerage account. It just had different wording, um, but what they're really saying is do what's best for your client, not what's going to pay you the most, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes down to the bottom line. And it's, you know, if it goes back to um, someone along the way, you know, doing the wrong thing. Um, but so there are three ways that, for, that financial planners get paid. One is commission. That's what Kelly's talking mm -hmm. about, about a small account. 
that instead of having an annual fee on it, you get paid when you do the investments initially mm -hmm. because you know you need to be paid every year for the investment. Right. So that's commission. Mm -hmm. Then you have fee based advisors. So I and then you have fee only. So I'm fee only. And then you have fee based means you can take a commission on an insurance product okay. or an annuity. So you have three ways to get paid as an advisor. And you want to make sure that, you know, first of all, you should know, I always ask people, what, what some, when I was a broker, people would say to me, how much do you get paid on this? Or I would say, this is what I, get, I charge. Because when somebody says that they're not, you don't pay them or there's no fee on this, <laughs> yes. there's a fee. <laughs> okay. And it's interesting to see how much it is. And, then, and I was appreciative of what I learned during that time period. But you need to ask how you get paid and the CFP, in my opinion, the CFP is the most important part of the, uh, the equation. That means you have had the education and the knowledge and that you take that person fiduciary responsibility. As a CFP, we have to be fiduciary. Oh, so you have to be a fiduciary if you're a CFP, is that what you're saying? Would be, you're required by the ethics of it, yes. So anybody that has CFP is a fiduciary or no, not necessarily? Well, you can have a CFP that's not a financial advisor and managing money. You know, they could just be involved in preparing the financial plan. But that's that's the most important letters to have next to your name because you go through some and some of the letters and then you go online and you kind of research it and stuff. Well, I joke that I have a lot of an alphabet soup, yeah. you know, yeah. because, yeah. because I, you know, I think yeah. I have 10 designations. Sure. Yeah. The CFP is the most important, mm -hmm. unless I were a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer. That's the most important one. No, but, no. Um, <laughs> but I don't do any financial stuff. I don't know. Go see Sarah or Kelly. <laughs> but anyway, I, CFP is very important. I think I'm very thank you. Oh, yeah, I agree. And um, we will actually almost require a financial plan uh, when we start with a new client um, because it helps us get to know you and it really helps you get to know yourself and what you need your money to do for you you know over the rest of your lifetime and that was and amy question. asked um, what is it is it does it make sense is it okay to ask the fee of course it's okay absolutely yeah um, and um, it is as sarah said an annual percentage uh, ours is charged monthly. Broker down charged monthly. It used to be four yeah. Yeah. With regard to fees, I know for attorneys, as part of our rules of professional conduct, that we have to discuss the fees. So, is that one of your ethical uh, requirements that you need to be upfront with your clients from the get go as to how you charge your fees? Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to be licensed in Pennsylvania or in practice but be licensed in another state. You have to be licensed in every state that we have clients. It's five, five in many states, five with clients. So I might work with somebody in North Carolina and, and, and but once I have five people in that state, I must be licensed by North Carolina. But I'm licensed here as Kelly is in Pennsylvania. And so we can work anywhere in the country. But once we have so many people in a certain state, like I have a lot of clients in Florida, is that we have to, once it's five, um, Texas is one, Massachusetts is one person, then I, you have to be licensed in that state as well. Did that answer your question? Okay. And well, actually one more part, is that the firm or you individually? Okay, that's a rarely good question. Yeah. Okay, so when I had my own business, I was the investment registered investment advisor. Now that I'm part of a firm, the advisor is the firm, Markale Wealth Management. So that's a good question when they're looking for an advisor. Are they alone or are they part of a group? So if it's just me being the advisor, then I'm the one that has to get licensed in the different states. But if it's a firm like Morgan Stanley is all over the country, mm -hmm. so then it's just Kelly following the rules of Morgan Stanley. And, and the I firm does it for us. Maybe. I mean, we might have to pay for it, but the firm does it for us. And we, we have to be registered, even if we just have one client. Do you? Uh, yeah. That's their rules, but for us, it's, it depends mm -hmm. on the state. Okay. okay. 
All right, uh, Kim, why don't you start with um, need for an attorney? I think that was about um, if we need an attorney for a will. Okay. What I think might be helpful to start with that would be like just talking about the basic estate planning document, which would be the will. Um, and what does a will do? And what does a will need to say? Um, That's an executive. Exactly, all, all of the fiduciaries that you're going to appoint. Um, and in the legal sense, a fiduciary is, um, I owe a fiduciary duty to my clients. So when I'm assisting and administering an estate, I owe a fiduciary duty to the executor. I also owe a fiduciary duty to all of the beneficiaries and all of the creditors. So basically it's, you know, doing what is in the best interest for everyone, making sure that nobody's being cheated and making sure that we administer the estate um, according to the legal requirements. Now, when it comes to writing a will, we can have simple wills or we can have complex wills. Um, and, you know, depending upon what your financial situation is, is going to um, be a good indicator as to how complex your will should be. If you die without a will in Pennsylvania, it, you're said to have died in testy. Um, so it's in intestacy. And at that point, it means that the walls of the Commonwealth say where your estate goes. It doesn't mean the state gets your estate. It just means that the state says where it goes. Um, so if you die without a will, they're going to look at, first of all, are you married? And then do you have children? Are those children of the marriage to the spouse that you were married to at the time of your death? So um, a lot of that, when it comes to the intestacy rules, it tends to go by that if you're married, you usually mean your spouse is your executor and so on and so forth. When it's second marriages and there are children of a first marriage, um, the law tends to just, you know, kind of throw some people in there together. Um, so um, I recommend that people have wills because it makes my job a little easier on the tail end as to who gets the right to administer the estate. Um, the statute has the spouse, if there's a spouse, and if not, then it would be um, the children. And then after that, it looks at, well, who are the residual beneficiaries of the estate? Who's entitled to your estate under the intestacy laws? And, um, you know, Sometimes people get along and lots of times they don't. So having that will will set forth who is going to take care of your matters when you pass away. Um, and so when it comes to selecting an executor um, that you would put in your will, um, who you nominate, it's important that you can have one person, you can have multiple person, persons. However, the key here is, do they get along? And not what you think do they get along, but do they really get along? If there are strong differences of opinion, um, I will um, I ask that you really think long and hard about that. Because if there are differences, go ahead. And I don't want to interrupt, but, okay. but make it an odd number. When I was, a, a, I mean, I've been a trust office over 100 years. And you, you want it to be odd numbers, one person, three person, five person, you know, I like, not <laughs> and, and sorry. Go okay, ahead. Um, so with the odd number, that is good. Um, I do tell this story often, and it must it's, I must have PTSD because of it, because um, uh, an older attorney who was getting ready to retire had said, oh, Kim, you're so patient. You would be perfect for this estate. I should have run the other way, um, <laughs> yeah. because it was a brother and a sister, and it wasn't known to me, but they didn't get along. They got along on nothing. They disagreed just to disagree. And by the end, we weren't even through with the estate. Um, I had to refer the daughter to separate counsel and the son to separate counsel so that they could petition the court about photographs. Wow. And I was just like, I'm out of here. <laughs> like, you know, you photographs of the family. Photographs of oh, the family. Oh. So, and then everything else was a mess too, but photographs was the big issue. So, um, you know, what that ends up doing is costing everybody a lot of money. When there are differences of opinion, um, then, you know, we've got to try to work to um, see if we can resolve it, if there's a consensus. And if not, then, you know, we would look majority rules. 
Um, ultimately, the executor has the authority to make those decisions. However, when I'm advising an estate, I'm not, I mean, I will um, speak up if I think the executor is doing something that is not in the best interest of everyone. And people have said to me, well, this is a, this is a time that my children can get along. Yeah. This is a time that every, <laughs> everybody will be calm. Uh, it's absolutely the opposite. Wrong. Wrong. You know, and it is amazing. Um, how many people say, oh, well, this is what mom would have wanted. And, you know, mom may not have wanted anything like that, but people have ideas in their head. And, um, you know, lots of times it is about money, but for me, what I've seen is about control. Who has control? Even on the stupidest issues, it's control. Like, so I'm the bossy big sister, oldest sister. So, um, of course, my siblings are probably going to say that I have to have control, but, um, but that didn't stop my dad from naming all four of his children as co-executors. But oh, um, oh, 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 oh. I call that I call that death by a committee. Committee <laughs> 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 to make every decision. Yeah. So to answer the question, a power of attorney ceases on the date of death, yeah. and the executor and and uh, Kim will go further into this. But if the executor handles, somebody asked the question between the executor and trustee. So an executor handles the thing. They're responsible by law. To take what's in the estate and pass it on according to the will. A trustee has a longer responsibility. And so in terms of pass it on, but first got to pay the taxes and the creditors. Right. So like, that, that all comes, comes first, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so now do you have a question? Oh, we have a question from um, our folks on Zoom. It says, may an executor refuse to serve? And if so, then what? Oh, yes, yes. Just because you're appointed or nominated does not mean you have to serve, which I kind of like that because if I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. So um, with that, they decline. Um, and typically what we say is that they renounce their right to serve. So um, when somebody dies, and I'll talk a little bit about probate and non-probate in a few minutes, but when somebody passes away, assuming we have to make the appointment of the executor official, we have to probate the will or go to the probate court. Um, if somebody is named in the will, they either they have to renounce or, you know, if they passed away, we just have to provide documentation to the register of will saying that person had, has predeceased um, and that they can't serve. So then we will go to the alternate. And I always recommend people being at least, you know, two, if not three alternates, because you don't know what the circumstances are going to be in the future, you know, ages, illness, um, and Lots of times clients say, well, you know, I can change it in the future, but what happens if you don't change it and now something has happened and you're incapacitated and you can't change it? So naming those alternates is not a bad idea. Um, so if we were to get to a point where everyone says, no, I want nothing to do with this, um, which could happen, then we would look to what, as I was talking about, the intestacy statutes, who would have the right to be appointed um, if there wasn't a will? So we would look at it be the spouse and then you know children, beneficiaries of the estate. And it even gets to the point where creditors, they're on the list, they can petition the court to be appointed. So if you have a creditor who's owed a lot of money and nobody wants to probate the estate, then that creditor can petition the court and then have to give notice to all the people who have a higher ranking to get permission to be appointed to serve as the administrator of the estate. Could you explain the surety bond? In Pennsylvania, and exactly. okay. um, surety bonds. Um, in Pennsylvania, if you have a will, and in the will there is a clause that says that your fiduciaries do not have to post a bond, then when they go to the court, then there's no need to go get a bond. And what a bond is, is the court will look at, or when I say court, I mean the register of wills. The register of wills will look at um, what's the value of the estate? And then we'll typically require that a bond be purchased that's twice the amount of the estimated amount of the estate. And what that bond is, is if you're, you have to apply for it and the bond is going to ensure that the executor or administrator will administer the estate and won't run off with all the funds. Because if the administrator runs off all the funds, the surety bond company is on the hook. So, um, if the person who is asking to be appointed does not have a good credit rating, um, it's likely that that person will not be bonded unless there is somebody else 
of a higher caliber who's going to guarantee that they will control the funds um, to allow that other person to be appointed as a co-administrator. And those can be expensive. Um, I had one, I think we had to get, it was a $500,000 bond and it was $1,500. Now that's a two year period. And the first year is paid in full. So, I mean, the whole thing's paid in full, but even if we settle the estate in six months, you don't get a refund on it. But once that first year, or it's earned, once the first year is up, then you would get a refund on whatever portion of the second year we don't need. So, and if the administration has not been completed, we have to renew that bond. And then there is the refund that's offered after that, um, depending upon how long it takes to administer the estate. Um, so now, a lot of times in Pennsylvania, you put it in a will, it says that I, we don't, the, the executive doesn't need a bond. Mm -hmm. So that would be a question. The reason I haven't seen that in a long time, that somebody has to pay a bond. Right. Well, I've just had a couple of them. I've had two of them. Um, and in that case, the first one was where um, the um, son died. He's an adult son, no wife, no children. And his dad wanted to be appointed as a co-administrator. Because if you don't have somebody listed in your will as an executor, they're called an administrator. So when I use those terms, the administrator is somebody who's not appointed under the will, an executor is. So dad wanted to do it, and he wanted his adult daughter who lives in Maryland to serve. We had to get a bond on the daughter because she's not a Pennsylvania resident and she was not listed in the will. Now, if dad wanted to serve alone, we would not have needed to get a bond in Lancaster County because Lancaster County says if it is a Lancaster County resident for a Lancaster County decedent, we don't need a bond. But if dad would have lived in York County and son was in Lancaster, we would have had to have gotten a bond. Oh, no, if there's not a will. If there's not a will. If the will says there's no, um, usually the will says that there's no requirement for any fiduciary to file. So whether or not it's somebody who is named in the will or somebody who is appointed because everybody said I'm not serving and we have to go look at the intestate statute, there's still no requirement for a bond. If it's in the will, it's in the will. And also the other one I had was a gentleman passed away and unfortunately both of his adult sons had predeceased him. He was not married. And so then the one of the beneficiaries was a minor grandchild. And it was the deceased decedent's mother who was petitioning because we had a minor, a minor beneficiary without a will, we had to get a bond for the grandmother or for the mother to serve. So um, actually I had those two cases within a month of each other. So um, and the importance of that is to people don't want to spend the money. Oh my gosh, I have to put it in the will. I have to go talk to the lawyer and collect money. But it's so important because you spend money. That you don't know that you're spending because you just don't want to. You, you're cheap at this in this table, but it's important because you're going to be saving money over here. And that was the question I think is if you have to have an attorney for a will. Now, what if Kim, you have um, IRA accounts and maybe uh, a non-IRA account that's joint with someone, and you don't own a house, home? Okay. What are the needs for a will? Okay. Well. I always recommend everybody, if you want to select somebody, you need a will. Because you might think I have everything co-owned with somebody else and that they might inherit it by operation of law. Um, and with married couples, mostly nine times out of 10, we don't need to probate the will. If everything's jointly titled or it has a beneficiary designation, we don't need the will. But you never know. That individual who died in a car accident could have a cause of action against whoever may have caused the accident. It's much easier if you have somebody appointed who's then going to spearhead that litigation. Then, all right, all right well, my kid might get some of the, the um, wrongful death survival proceeds and so might my spouse. So if you don't have that will, there could be a dispute. Whereas if you name your executor, the executor has the first bite at the apple. So you've got one person spearheading it, um, especially if there are parties that don't agree. <laughs> and she brought up a point. There are three ways of passing property at death. And she said operation of law. That means that you follow. So you have the will, the executor's responsible for passing everything that isn't under the other way. The other is joint tenants. So I own my house with my husband. Uh, I'm a widow of seven years. My husband um, at 
when I sold my house four years after he died, all I, all I had to do was give a death certificate because it was really my house. So that's joint tenants. And then the third way is by contract, which is what Kelly was talking about through an IRA beneficiary designation. A contract would be a life insurance policy. So you want to have the executor that is responsible. I thought it was really smart because my husband was sick for two years and I had everything all taken care of and made it sure it was in my name or whatever. Well, nine months after he died, there were shares in his company, the Nissan, that I had to have his will uh, probated. So you never know. And that's why it's really, really important to have a will, even though you don't think you're ever going to need it. And um, just adding on to what Sarah had said, we're going to talk about what's probate property and what is non-probate property. So non-probate property are assets that at your death can pass without, um, without anybody else doing anything. So such as the operation of law, joint tenants with right of survivorship or tenants by the entireties. It's that survivorship component that means at your death, the surviving co-tenant or tenant then receive the property. Now that doesn't mean there's not tax due, but they receive the property without the need to probate the will. Same with the beneficiary designations, or if you have a payable on death or transfer on death designation, it means you're saying who gets this property when you die. Um, also, that doesn't exclude it from taxes. It also does not exclude it from claims of creditors in many cases. So it's just saying, all right, it doesn't have to go through probate. And what probate means is that if you have an asset that is in your name alone and there's no other way for it to get to a successor, um, there's no beneficiary designation, there's no um, co-ownership with that right of survivorship, then the will has to be probated or you have to go through probate for the, to have an administrator, administrator appointed. And then what that means is once that executor is appointed, you get what we call a short certificate. And it's literally a short piece of paper um, that has a seal that says that on this day, um, the executor appeared before the register of wills and was sworn in. And then the register officially appoints the individual to be the executor or administrator. And it's a sealed document. And that is needed for, um, you know, with the shares, as Sarah said, you know, in order to facilitate getting those shares to be transferred um, to the estate, and then assuming that her husband's will said everything went to her, she had to show a short certificate saying that she has the official authority to take care of that. So think about it is if you own your house or if you own an asset and you die, there's nothing on that asset that says where it goes, that more likely than not will be a probate asset. And there are a lot of people out there, <clears throat> particularly not as much anymore, that's come through Lancaster County as salesmen and said, we want everything to go in trust. Or we want to have a financial plan because probate is so bad. And it is not bad in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, in Pe in Pennsylvania probate is not a dirty word. And actually I prefer probate because when we try to do it, like, oh, you don't need probate. Oh, you can do a small estate petition. Nine times out of 10, that ends up costing more money than if we really just probated the will or had somebody appointed. And it could be like, okay, there's nothing. And then nine months later, we discover, oh, there's okay. stock or there's something. So if you have that executor appointed or at least have the will, it helps make things run smoother. You never know what's gonna show up. So to, to answer the question, do you need an attorney to prepare a will? The worst situation that I had at Hershey Trust when I was there was a person who wrote their own will. <laughs> and and what it did, what, what the scene didn't write it for the, uh, the spouse did. And she didn't put a clause. Um, what Kelly uh, can talk about is about paying taxes. They didn't have a tax clause in the world because they didn't know they needed one. So who's going to pay the death taxes on probate property or non-probate property is really important. Do you want the uh, the residuary beneficiary to pay? Or do you want each person who's getting property to pay? And that's why I would never prepare my will alone. I would have it go with an attorney. And, and with wills, um, if it's a simple will, they're relatively inexpensive, all right? Um, and so, you know, when I do meet with clients, we're not just talking about your will. We also want to see, okay, well, what is your overall estate plan, okay? What are your assets? How many are probate and how much is non-probate? 
but then also coordinating those beneficiary designations to make sure it does what you think it's doing. Um, I always review beneficiary designations just to be sure that it says what you think. Do you have an alternate lined up? Um, you know, how do you want it to be distributed to alternate beneficiaries? Do you have minors? Um, so, I mean, I've run into situations where somebody wrote their own will, and unfortunately, it was a very complicated situation, and they also had a charity involved, which then meant not only did I petition the court, I had to get the attorney general involved because there was a charity involved. And whenever there's a charity that's receiving more than $25,000 or is receiving a percentage of what's left of the estate, the attorney general in Pennsylvania is automatically a party because they stand to represent the interests of charities so that charities aren't taken advantage of. So it was a good thing that the attorney general that was assigned to it, I went to law school with and had a good relationship with and could explain this convoluted situation. Um, and we ended up getting it resolved, but it was a lot of time because I have to write a petition to explain the mess that the decedent got themselves into and what did the decedent actually intend and what- Because they don't want to pay a thousand dollars, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> When you said charity, is that the same as a nonprofit, which would be like a church? But Kim, well, I say charity, Kim, it would be yeah. um, the folks on Zoom are having trouble hearing the questions. So if you okay, could just sure, come, sure. just repeat okay. it for them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, what is a charity? Is a charity the same as a church? It would be, or a nonprofit. Um, when we say charity, it would be typically it's somebody who's exempt from tax under 503B of the Internal Revenue Code or other charitable entities. Um, and usually we ask to see when I have a beneficiary of um, an estate that is a charitable entity, I ask them to send their, uh, it's like their tax exemption clearance letter. So that tells me then that that entity does not have to pay taxes. And for the most part, it'd be churches, nonprofits, hospice. Um, actually, I just sent a letter here. Um, I had a, a client who made a residual gift, meaning a percentage of what was left over to hospice. And so, you know, I had to send them and when I sent out notices saying, all right, we've appointed an executor. I also include the attorney general on that. So, um, you know, it's to protect the interests of, um, of charities. And I want to talk about that in a second because that's really important as to where you do the distributions to charity and debt. But uh, one of the things I want to like uh, Kim was talking is, if you remarry in Pennsylvania and you don't prepare a new will, then it's like you're in Texas, is that correct? Um, it is treated, um, yes, it's, it's treated as in Texas, and it's a modification by circumstance is what the statute says. So it means you have changed your will by getting married. Right. So, so that people don't know that. And they just think, oh, well, it's a second marriage and my money goes to my children because I'm not married. Well, if I marry, my husband will, my new husband would have a, a percentage of my estate. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted everybody to know that because I don't think people have a clue about that. And, and, when it, and that's a good point. When it comes to when do you um, review your estate planning documents, when do you review your investment beneficiary designations, is anytime there's a life change, mm -hmm. as in addition to every so many years. Usually, I recommend if um, like every three to five years, you just check in with your attorney. And usually I try to send letters out saying, hey, you know, nothing's really changed in the law. I've looked at the things, you know, we're like, oh, you now have adult children. Maybe you want to name your adult children um, as one of your fiduciaries as an alternate or actually as the primary. So looking at it then, um, you know, if you get remarried, certainly a time to look at things. Um, now, when you remarry, um, even with a prenup, even with a prenup, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it depends on what the prenup says. Typically, if the prenup says that they waive all rights, I mean, prenups are complicated documents for the most part. So if you have a prenup, depending on whether it says they waive all rights under the will or what have you, it may have been waived, it may not have been. It just depends upon how comprehensive it is. But I wouldn't just bank on, oh, I have a prenup, we're good to go. That's the time, if you're getting a prenup, you better have everything looked at so that you know where your assets are going and what you're waiving your rights to of your new spouse. Question, Amy? When you're, when you're going through an attorney and you're, getting, you're putting together your estate plan, and the will is one aspect of it, are there any other aspects that you should be thinking about when you're meeting with an attorney that you want to have as part of your full plan? Right. Um, we're talking about um, 
other things that we do when we're looking at your estate plan. Um, and I will get to that. There are other documents to definitely consider, um, but are there other questions about the will? I just have a question if there's any advice or suggestion on how to choose an executor. I have no children. Um, my, my cousin right now is my executor, but in terms of a backup, I, I know I should have one. And um, I, the person has to want to do it. I mean, I would ask the person first if they and would want the to, do to do it. And they and have to have the wherewithal to do it. That is correct. Um, it, it, is it like, can a bank? Um, um, the question is selection of executor. You know, if you don't have children or um, what have you, you might name a, a relative who could do it, but like, who do you have as alternate? Um, you know, Sarah did mention the person has the ability to do it and the desire to do it. Um, typically, in most states, usually an attorney is involved with probating the will and helping to make sure that you get the appropriate tax returns filed and give notice to everybody that you're required to. Um, so we can help executors along the way a lot. But there are what we call institutional um, or corporate fiduciaries, and that would be a trust company. Some banks can have fiduciary abilities, not all. So that's just something important to ask about. Um, there are trust companies, banks. Um, I have served as an executor on occasion. It's not what I like to do. Right. However, if it's somebody that, um, that I've grow close to and I know, um, and they really feel more comfortable with that, I will do it. Um, I try to avoid that in almost all situations. Um, but I mean, I am willing to, I'm like, oh, well, you know, your bank, you know, lots of banks have um, trust departments that are equipped, and that's what they do. I mean, that's what they do. They know how to do all of that. Um, and even when you have a corporate fiduciary, typically they're doing a lot of the work that the attorney would do with regard to preparing inheritance tax returns and those things, but they still have the attorney to file documents and to sign off on the bottom line because it's the attorney who is the one who's saying this is done correctly. Can you talk about, I get really upset when I have a, in, a, a will that I see or a trust and it says, I need to use Kim Carter Patterson as the attorney. She wrote the document and it says in there. And I did not put that in. It's so, <laughs> it's so self-serving. I don't think it's pompous. It drives me crazy. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pompous, really. Mm. Um, and with that, just keep in mind that, that the executor, whoever's appointed as executor, it is his or her or their right to select an attorney. They do not have to use really the important. attorney who is written in, who, who wrote the will. Now, lots of times, depending on the attorney that's involved, I try to gather as much information as I can about finances and situation, who the other um, professionals are. Um, and it's amazing, sometimes I get clients to tell me more than they would ever dream of telling their children so that I have a good idea. So I could be in a position to help them. But if the children have a good relationship or whoever's named as the executor's a good relationship with an attorney um, who, who practice in that area, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to fight for it. So just because Kim's holding the will because she prepared it does not mean you have to right. use Kim. Right. But you can take the will from the lawyer's office. Mm -hmm. And it happens a lot mm -hmm. that they don't want to work there because maybe there's a conflict from the executor with the attorney. You never know. But they can take the will anywhere to any law firm mm -hmm. in Lancaster County. And, and, and what do you do? Up to you. Yeah, and what do you do with your original will? Um, for almost all of my clients, there might be just a handful over the last several years um, that I've practiced. <laughs> um, it is, um, you know, you can have your. I mean, I let clients take their original wills, but in most cases, I retain the original will and keep it in the vault. Because when you die, if we have to go to probate, we have to surrender the original will. Now, if the original has been lost or something, then we have a little hearing before the register of wills, but we have to put our testimony to say, no, look, it was lost, but that doesn't mean they revoked it. You know, if you saw their house, you would know why we can't find it. But typically, if the will is lost, it is presumed to have been destroyed and revoked. So it's important that you have that original will. And so I just keep it in my vault. And um, 
and then it's there and it's available and clients always get photocopies of their will and it has a stamp that says like the original is lodged in my firm's vault um so there's only one will that you sign um and almost all wills will say that uh, at the very beginning that you hereby revoke any and all wills and codicils heretofore made. I mean, anything you've written before is revoked by this will. Um, and so I usually recommend if you need to change your will, instead of doing a codicil, which is kind of an addendum that gets read with the will. Um, and I like to think of that because, you know, secretaries didn't want to have to go type the whole document. Now that we have, um, we have word processing and it's not that difficult to print out the document. I usually say, let's just do a whole new will to make sure everything's up to date. And if that codicil were to disinherit somebody because they were mentioned in the first will, even though it's modified, they still get noticed. So the person you disinherited now knows you disinherited them. You might not want them to know that or you might not care. <laughs> But we have to make sure then that, that we have the codicil and the will because they both have to be probated. So it's better to have one document than two. When I lived on Farmingdale Road, which is just you know, a mile from here, is that there were uh, a couple that were, were killed in, uh, when they went home to, I think it was Indiana, it's not important. But it took four days for the family. They went through everything in the house to find a will. Mm -hmm. And they did it. Thank heavens they had a will because they didn't have any children. So both are gone. Where does the money go for? both of them. But the important part is, is and, and I've had people who have changed beneficiaries. And and so I say, you don't want to cut a cell because you don't want them to know that they're getting 150000 less, you know, because they uh, were mad. When I worked at a, uh, an attorney's firm uh, with a fellow, every time his daughter wanted him to take a bath, he would come in and want to change his will because he was so angry <laughs> at her taking care of him. So, you know, it's um, it was very, very interesting. So now I think there's one other question about a will. Yeah. yeah. This is kind of going back. Um, when my husband died, we had a very simple will, uh, and we have six kids, so it was everything. Like six kids. <laughs> <laughs> but everything either went to him or went to me, and then if something happened to both of us, went equally to six kids. We didn't do grandkids. We figured they could take care of that portion, but it went to six kids. But my question is because you mentioned about changing things, just changing the name on cards is like an issue. Do you have to go to every 401k, every stock that's held, and go back and change that beneficiary on all of those? Well, that, on, on a lot of those, there is an, uh, a question. beneficiary that, yeah. What was the question? Oh, Just for, the question was, if, uh, if, you know, if you have everything goes to the reciprocal between a husband and a wife, and then it goes to each other, and then it goes to the kids, but if one of you die, do you have to go change all the beneficiary designations? Um, and that is one of the things that's one of the reasons that I like to look at beneficiary designations because what is your first and then contingent? And then there are often times that I'll have clients being tertiary beneficiaries so that if this one doesn't work, it goes to this one and it goes to here. So if you're looking at those things and you looked at your beneficiaries, you can have already taken care of that in advance, sort of as your will does. Now, there are some assets that might not permit that. But if you only name one beneficiary and that beneficiary predeceases you, then it's going to go to whatever the terms of the contract say. Does the contract say that it goes to your estate and is distributed that way? Or does the contract say it goes to your children? So if you want it to go a certain way, it's a good idea to name those contingent beneficiaries. Because if you haven't named one and you change it, then you need to go to all of those beneficiaries. I mean, we all have situations right. where uh, it, Kelly. Uh, have it. the beneficiary designation isn't as the decedent thought or as the, the, the survivor thought the decedent thought. Uh, possibly he, had, he or she had an ex-spouse as a beneficiary and didn't change it. Um, or just simply, for instance, a friend of mine just passed away. And um, back in 2019, had had um, adjusted all of his beneficiary designations on his IRA, life insurance, annuities, those types of things, and redid the will. Um, when when he redid the will, um, he had a list of accounts and beneficiaries for each account. And then when he passed, there were two accounts 
that had different beneficiary designations with um, Morgan Stanley than on his list. And his wife, a new wife actually, knew that um, he wanted those two accounts to go to his boys, but yet she was named as beneficiary. Um, so she could um, disclaim um, receiving those funds, but um, I'm not required to. No, no. And I mean, we've all had umpteen situations where the beneficiary designation didn't get changed, and, um, and there's we not a whole lot you can do. And we assume, well, your husband's gone, you can change it when you're living. The problem is that maybe you don't have capacity. Mm -hmm. It's called testamentary capacity, is that you have to have the ability to make the changes. So I, I, I love her word tertiary, is that you want to make sure that the beneficiary, the, the primary beneficiary, mm -hmm. is who you want. Then you want to have the contingents. And even if, and so we call it per stirpes, that one of your children dies, you live to be 95, and one of your children predeceases you, do you want their children to get the money or do you want it to go to the other five? And so they're the decision, really important decisions to whoever is your advisor, certainly your attorney. Go to lawyer, it, sounds very confusing. <laughs> it sounds confusing and it can be, but we're so used to doing it that we can walk you right through it. And as Sarah was talking about per stirpes, that's a very, very important um, term. Um, and it's, excuse me, it's Latin for by the roots, which means that if something, if you say you give your estate to your children per stirpes, how do you spell that? P E R S T I R P E S. Two words. Two words. Two words. It looks, it, you would think it's per stripes, but you reverse the I and the R. Can <laughs> I spell that again? P E R okay. S T I R P E S. Thank you. You're welcome. So you have per stirpes, meaning my children, uh, if I have children, I don't get But if my, <laughs> if my daughter had children, she would receive her stirpings means that her children would get her portion of my estate. Okay. The other choice is per capita. Okay. And that's a major question that I have with people. If you don't have any children and you want it to go to your nieces and nephews, yeah. do you do it that with the child, your sister who has four children, do they get the same a fourth of your sister's mm -hmm. share? Mm -hmm. Or does each of the 12 nieces yeah. and nephews need? That's per capita, they each share okay. equally. Okay. And then also have to bear in mind that you might say to my four children, and your intent <laughs> is that if one of your children predeceased you, you want his or her children to inherit his or her share. So each level then is divided. So it sort of it just sort of trickles down. Um, and whatever the survivor would have been entitled to then gets divided equally among his or her um, descendants. However, if you were just to say, now depending on the beneficiary designation, but if you were to say, I leave it to my children and leave it at that, does that mean it's just your surviving children? Does it mean if one of your children predeceases you, that his or her share goes to his or her children? So there's also the per capita, but if it's your children, do you want it just to go to your surviving children? Because, oh, the other one that their parent has predeceased, they would have been taken care of. Or do you want the children of your deceased child to inherit. So that's something I'm always asking clients. We'd like, I want it to go to my kids. Well, where do you want a deceased child share to go? And so that's where we'd say to your children or the survivor of them, or do you want it per service where it will trickle down? And that's a question people don't like to talk about it. I mean, my mother-in-law didn't talk to me for nine months because I said, what if all of us are gone? Where do you want your money to go? I mean, the kids were in high school. And so we could all, four of us, my husband and I and the children could all be on a trip and we could get hit by a car like I hit my neighbor from Indiana, right? They got hit by truck and, and they were gone. And my mother-in-law, she goes, I don't want to think about that. We have to, you have to decide what if all the bad things happen. Right. Another question that I see a lot is what if I, do you want your, your wonderful daughter-in-law to receive the money instead of the children? And that's a question, and then we'll talk about that when we go to the trustee question. But what what do you really want to happen? Do you want to disinherit your, your daughter-in-law or your son-in-law? Because if you do the children for stirpes or whatever, it goes right to the children. And, and so also when you're thinking about well, how do you want to leave your estate? And you've got that, do we just look at the children and then it trickles down? 
Do you want um, your child's spouse to be included? Well, what happens if your child gets divorced? Mm. You know, so it makes it more complicated if you are planning to provide for in-laws. But if you don't mention an in-law specifically, they're skipped. Mm. Um, and that's how the intestacy law would work. So, um, yeah, there's a question. Can I do something just as simple as appointing, if you have two children, appointing one of them to be the beneficiary to all of everything that you have, the IRAs and the savings accounts and things, and then have a separate um, sheet saying she will designate this amount of money to the other dollar. The question is, um, can you do something as simple as in your will and with your beneficiary designations is giving it all to one child and then having a separate document saying, I want that child to do this, this, and this with them. My answer would be no. Um, you possibly could, but it doesn't mean that what your wishes are are going to be followed because if your will says it goes to Sally, once Sally, that right vests in Sally, it doesn't matter what you have written on something else unless you've done something pretty convoluted. Sally gets it. To simplify, a, a will covers everything that isn't set aside by beneficiary designation. So, uh, as I said, your IRA accounts, life insurance, annuities, anything that you can assign a beneficiary to, it goes according to the beneficiary designation. Then what's left is what your will covers. So what's left Obviously, I guess you could have go to one daughter, right. but still she has no. And you could try to say, all right, Sally, I want you when I die to give your brother John X percentage of this IRA or this, but that has income tax and gift tax consequences with it. So while you think you might be simplifying, you're actually making a mess. And I, I have a personal situation with that. So a life insurance policy, I was beneficiary and I am to give it to the 11 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But she's talking about the gift tax consequence. I can't give away more than $15,000 to a person a year, or I have to file a gift tax return and it comes off of my estate. And so the frustration with that is if my mother or whoever was the person who wanted that policy to go to the, to the 11 grandchildren, name the 11 grandchildren. It doesn't add a, a big, it's not a bigger problem. It's certainly easier to have one check. But each person of the 11 happened to have, they all should be named because you don't want that person, me, to have the gift tax consequences of giving the money away to the beneficiary. If there's other, other considerations, then it comes at you for multiple ways. Um, it could also affect Medicaid planning because if Sarah, let's say Sarah's run out of money and now she's receiving a government benefit, but she receives life insurance, it doesn't matter where somebody wanted her to give that money. If she gives it away, she could disqualify herself from government benefits she's already received. I didn't even think of that. So that's it, right. And I mean, so you have income, you could have income tax consequences depending on the type of the asset because you take the money out, you got to pay the income tax consequences, which reduces the value you know, gift tax consequences, Medicaid, planning consequences. So it's usually best if you have an idea, put it in there. Um, and that's usually where that your professional can help you. You know, if it's not all just your children, maybe we can switch this up to save death tax and income tax consequences, depending on your other assets. So it, it can get, um, you know, we can work with you, but, um, you know, it's usually best to put into place what your desired plan is rather so than getting, leaving it to someone else. So you talked, there was a question earlier about Medicaid planning. So let's kind of go over to that question and now. Is that with Medicaid planning, you can't give money away for five years before that? I have the five-year look back, but also let's say you had $75,000 that came in your name, but then you distributed it. Yes. They would still count it at the 15 thousand per year for the five years. years and before yeah. and before we before we get into medicaid because that's going to be its own thing and it gets really complicated um i have that written down here with that because it if we throw that at you right now you're just but my eyes would glaze over. So, but <laughs> so we sorry, move on a little bit. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, I think that you know when it comes to writing will um there I mean it's usually best if you um meet with an attorney, you can call, ask them what their costs are and those kinds of things, because I have had clients who have prepared their own wills 
and ask me to review them. And it's actually cheaper for me to just prepare the will from scratch than it is for me to go back and tell you what to fix. Because I know in the will forms that I use, I have the things and I revise them regularly. I have the provisions that I know we need. I don't have to go back through and look, well, all right, that's written that way. So it does cover this way. It, it's just easier to have your attorney prepare it from scratch. So be prepared when you go. Yeah. Have your children's names and addresses and <laughs> grandchildren's <laughs> names. Because if you meet with him and then I say, well, I'll get back to you with the names of my grandchildren or whatever. That just adds more time. So be prepared when you go to the attorney as to think about it ahead of time who you want to be your executor. Or and those day. things, you know, I can prepare them and say, all right, think about this. But if you're a procrastinator and you don't really need to look for reasons to procrastinate, that's a reason to procrastinate. Like, oh, now I got to think of this. So the more you can think about it, but don't let that keep you from going to seek the advice. So um, we always say to clients, too, from your financial plan, take your net worth statement to the attorney okay. that, um, that helps give her a very good picture of what you have and what estate planning you might need. But I think to summarize, I think to answer your original question, um, you probably need to go to an attorney for a will. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay, actually, I, I don't know. What I have is, it's in your packet. It's an estate planning checklist. And I send this out to clients in advance of meeting with them. And it walks through the three major documents and we'll come back a little later and talk about the other documents and trusts and those kinds of things. But sometimes my clients only complete the first page and that's all right, but just look through it. It just sort of puts you in that frame of mind of what to think about, what kind of information do we, are we going to discuss, what are your assets? And it looks more overwhelming than it is, but when you walk through it, I try to have definitions of this is what this kind of person does, this is what they do. And just things to think about that put you in that frame of mind. So um, I do have that in your packet. But just everyone, no matter how complicated your estate is, as Kim and as Sarah have said, make sure you review your beneficiary designations because of all the situations we talked about. And don't assume that you need a trust if somebody comes trying to sell you um, you know, a binder this big for five thousand um, dollars. Many other ways. Many of us. Even if they give you, even if they give you a free filet mignon dinner. That's my that's my big bug of the life. I think is that if they're going to give you a filet mignon dinner and then you go to meet with them. Is yeah, it's that pressure. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Actually, right. 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 even if it's quiche for breakfast, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's pretty good. Um, and probate is, is the key you pay to the register of wills. Right, I right. just wondered if, if you probate is not a big deal, and we can talk about that a little bit more. But honestly, yeah, I, I prefer the probate to the non probate just because it makes sure that everything is coming into the umbrella that I can keep an eye on, make sure that someone's not giving money away before they pay a creditor. Um, making sure we've got the information to claim on the inheritance tax return and what have you. So um, if we were in New York, Florida, Virginia, California, we would be talking a little bit, actually a lot differently. But Pennsylvania probate's not a dirty word. Um, and it's just a fee. You pay a fee based upon the estimated value of the estate, which isn't, I mean, when you look at everything else, it's very insignificant. Go ahead and think, Kim, in 30 words or less, can you <laughs> say what a power of attorney document is? Powers of attorney, I have the explanations in here, but those are documents that you will grant authority to another individual while you are alive to make, whether it's financial decisions and you can determine the scope, and also health care decisions. Now, they become effective at different points in time, but when you die, um, except in very, very limited circumstances in a healthcare power of attorney, all of the authority in your agent dies with you. And so in order for there to be a power of attorney of your estate then to continue doing things, the executor must be appointed. So think of the executor as a power of attorney for your estate. And as a power of attorney, you either want, or I, I always, correct, I'm not an attorney, but as a financial person, or so that my brother and I can do can segregate the jobs that we have that we don't have to sign everything. So if we name if it's Kelly and Sarah, then we have to sign and make every decision together. Right. But if you have or, 
Kelly can take care of the money. I can take care of the money. You know, they can divide and conquer. Yes. That's a big buzz of with the aunt. People put, well, I name my kid. Name and all six kids. Yeah. And make sure <laughs> they get along. Yeah. I definitely get that. Been there, done that. All right. Kelly. Sarah, would you like to talk about um, investment options or strategies? I think you had a question. Me. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it, it was very sh uh, shocking to me when I started in this business that people would say that you, your age from 100 is what you should have at the stock market. <laughs> And so if you're and but the first time, but if you're an 80 year old who has five million dollars, you can't you don't have to have just 20% in the stock market. So I'm not sure if that's the question. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, what is aggressive, what is moderate, what is options? I think just, IRAs, annuities, oh, just options, IRAs, annuities. I my husband passed and we have annuities and IRAs, and all I did was put everything in my name. I mean, his mm -hmm. contracts, he was um a financial planner so okay mm -hmm. his contracts were in his name from his 401ks and stuff and my contracts were in my name i well, just took all their ownership own. they're all now mine mm -hmm. but diversification i hear this all the time i'm sure kelly does too is that diversification means i have four financial advisors no 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 <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not joking i hear that all the time no 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 that i no. well I'm, I'm not moving my morgan stanley account no. or i'm not doing that no. But you could consolidate. When mm -hmm. my husband was living, he had a Roth IRA and an IRA or 401k. Mm -hmm. He had a joint account and my Roth and my IRA. So now I only have three my account, my Roth, and my IRA because you don't have to have so much. So a 401k upon death of a spouse, one of them down. So, yeah. well, the 401k is important, but it rolls over into an IRA. Right. And so what you want is to have one, a 403B, I have people who have 403Bs and IRAs, the 403B upon uh, retirement. What is a 403B? A 403B is a 401k for retirement, uh, okay. for a nonprofit. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. And I, I mentioned the that. The teachers have 403 bs yes. And, yes. and nurses and hospital mm -hmm. employees, et cetera. But they all can be merged into one IRA upon retirement. Okay. Um, and for a spouse, his IRA becomes yours. If, if, if it's a non-spouse, then they have an inherited IRA as opposed to just his now becoming yours. I guess my question basically concerns, I would want to consolidate. Um, my husband wrote a lot of the contracts because he was a financial planner. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was his area of expertise. It's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I guess I want to consolidate and move forward and review and make changes in if, how I'm diversified, how where I'm diversified. Yeah. So one of the things that we could, that we brought up with the questions was about what to do with it. So my biggest asset is my IRA because my husband, I just put money away over the years waiting for his retirement, our retirement, and he didn't get to retire. But the but uh, they changed the law about two years ago. Right. So that a spouse can inherit an IRA from each other and you still have the whole lifetime. Like I received my husband's IRA, it's now in mine, and I have my lifetime to take the money out. Um, I think it's up to age 115. So that's one of the questions. How do you calculate the required minimum distribution? You, and once you're 72 years old now, with the new law, right. it, it, there's a, uh, an IRS table that says this is how much you must take out every right. year based on your life expectancy. Yeah. 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 But maybe somebody else. Well, I knew it was seven. That, that, but it's based on the value on twelve thirty one. So I'm seventy two in about five years. But whenever it is, I will base it on what the value of my the, the Schwab Morgan Stanley. These guys figure it out for you. But the inherited IRA now, once my children receive, because I don't have a spouse, my children will receive my IRA. They must. Take that money out within ten years now. Kind of making it so grumpy, mm -hmm. but yeah. because it used to be, I could plan for my children to have that for the rest of their lives. Uh, but now it's ten years. A Roth and an IRA have to be distributed within ten years. And, and 
yeah, that could that could cause them tax issues. You know, if they're in the peak of their careers right. and have high income, and now they have to take that. Now they can wait until the tenth year to take it all. They don't have to take a tenth, a tenth, etc. But that is um, a time when you need to look at um, IRA beneficiary designations because maybe you have non-IRA money that um, you would want them to get and choose a charity to get the IRA money because the charity doesn't pay tax on. I call it tainted and non-tainted money. <laughs> that's my, that's Sarah making that up. But um, tainted money is that you're somebody, the beneficiaries are gonna pay the income tax. Everybody pays the death taxes. Kelly and Kim will make sure all the taxes are paid. The, all the death taxes are paid. If the income tax liability follows the IRA or the four, you know, the I four or three D. So what happens is I have it designated in my IRA beneficiary. Five percent goes to my church. Five percent goes to my college, Juniata College. Five percent goes to hospice. And so that'll come out, and they're not going. So fifteen percent of my IRA is going out to charity because they don't have to pay taxes on it, rather than it being in my will. If it's in my will, that's I call that, as I said, non-tainted money because there isn't any income tax liability following the, my will. The problem is I have to make sure there's enough money. That's all part of Kim's job is to make sure it's all right. What I call that, you know, tainted versus non-tainted, I call it getting more bang for your buck. So if you look at your type of asset, so let's say we have a retirement account, we have life insurance, and we have regular estate assets, which we're just going to say is cash. And you want to leave money to a charity, and you want to leave money to your children. Um, and let's say you have a niece or a nephew that you want to leave money to. Well, if you, whoever you name as a beneficiary of life insurance, there's no inheritance tax. There's no Pennsylvania death tax on it. There's also no income tax. So that might be where you name a niece or nephew because their tax rate is much higher than their children. So now if we're looking at a retirement account versus playing cash, um, non-charitable beneficiaries will have to pay income tax. Charities don't have to pay income tax. So think about it is if you took the money out of that account, would you have to pay income tax? If you have to pay income tax on it, so too will your beneficiaries when they take the money out. Except so, for the charity. Except for the charity. We're talking about people beneficiaries. So then if you want to leave money to your charity and you want to leave money to your kids, if you leave money to the charity, like cash, well, there's no income tax on that and there's no death tax. But if you leave then that IRA retirement account to your children, they have death tax, which we can't escape, but then they also get the income tax. So wow. if you leave the um, if you leave the retirement account to a charity such as hospice, then hospice, there's no income tax and there's no death tax. And then if you leave the cash to your kids, well, cash isn't going to carry with it an income tax consequence. So there's no inheritance tax to the kids and they only have to pay the death tax. And so she alluded to that is that it's, it's not as bad as it used to be in Pennsylvania, but spouses, I, they call it 0%. I always love it. I guess they <laughs> want to be able to change that quickly someday. But I, when my husband died, I didn't owe any tax right. back and forth. Right. Children are now down and it used to be six percent four and a half percent so my husband's this is inherited inherited it's not income tax income tax is whatever bracket it is but it's zero percent for spouses four and a half percent to your children twelve percent if i leave money to my brother or sister it's twelve percent and then if i leave money to kim because she's been a wonderful friend it's 15 percent so that's a big deal yeah it is it's a big difference and that's why you, you think should i give my 15 percent person a piece of my life insurance and that's why when i meet with clients and and say because they're dealing with your finances they need that information but that's one of the reasons that i'm asking for your financial information i want to know information about your um insurance account i mean your life insurance accounts and also you know let's look at those beneficiary designations because who really wants to give the government more money than you have to no. um, so that's like getting more bang for your buck so if you are charitably inclined or if you have non-children um, beneficiaries or non-spousal beneficiaries, you really want to take a look at, well, how can I minimize the tax consequences? Some we can't avoid, but there are some that we can lessen the blow. 
And I get really frustrated when I have four siblings. There's no children or grandchildren involved. And so um, I had a situation of a family that was six siblings and they was in Coryville and they just kept giving money to each other. Every time they died, somebody would pay 12%. So there's, you know, in, and the money keeps getting taxed again and again and again. So I don't wanna get ahead of, ahead of the situation and talk about trust, but um, the register, uh, the required minimum distribution comes out now, as I said, at 72. It used to be 70 and a half. It's now 72. But you're allowed to give money to charities. And so it's really awesome now that it's called a qualified charitable distribution, the QCD that we have that's on the board there. Qualified charitable distributions can come out now, and they're the same at 70 and a half. So my plan is I uh, just made a pledge that at, when I'm at 70 and a half, my I will be giving this charity a distribution every year out of my IRA. And so I get can't take a deduction on my income tax, but it's also not income. It's a way of getting money out of my IRA without having to pay any income tax on it. So, so I was just going to say, we often have clients, I'm sure you do too, say, I don't need that distribution. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take mm -hmm. it. I don't want to have to pay tax, mm -hmm. um, but you have to, you know, mm -hmm. or, or you'll receive a 50% penalty. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a great way to avoid being taxed on it. And it's better than a tax deduction because it's just not you can use it at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. It takes it, a, a couple, it's over $27,000 of uh, standard deduction on your taxes. It's a little over 27,000 for people who are over 65 and, and married. So you have to give away or because it's a maximum of $10,000 is what you're allowed to use as a default deduction that they talk about on TV all the time, that I can only deduct my property taxes and my uh, taxes that I pay for my paycheck. I can only go to $10,000. So that means if I were married, I'd still have to give at least $17,000 away to charity before I could deduct it at all. So the best place to take it, unless there's a talking to Kelly and I, will help you find the best place to do it. But the idea is that if you're not giving away $40,000 a year to charity, you should take it out of your IRA. But I, you know, I don't like to have standard rules of thumb. But the point is, is that the qualified charitable, charitable distribution, the QCD, is a fabulous way of giving to charity from your IRA without having to worry about the deductibility of it. I just want to get back to your main question. And I think um, the starting point for you, I'm sure you had a financial plan with your husband because my husband did all of it. The planner. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you probably need to start fresh and do yes. your own plan. I do too. And have someone look at all of your assets and determine what it is you need to live on the rest of your life. Um, you know, if you're, if you have long-term care insurance or, you know, you may need to pay for long-term care in the future, all of that and then um, figure out how all of those assets sh should be invested. And you may or may not have flexibility within some of the contracts like the annuities, um, but all of that needs to, to be reviewed. Which comes we, back to the question about what is the amount you should take out of your money every year. Now, with the IRA and the requirement of the distribution, the government tells you how much you have to take. I always tell people it's about 4%, when you're uh, mm. 72 years old. And then it gets to be, at, when you're 100, it's about 50% of the value of the IRA. So, but um, life has changed. I mean, I started in this business in 1978 and it was 5%. People, everybody took 5% out of their retirement and then knew you would have enough money for the rest of your life. Well, now with interest rates almost at zero, like it's 1%. Um, so, Call them the young guys in my office, the young people in my office, they are, they're telling people 4%. And so that's a distribution that you have to feel comfortable with. If you have a million dollars, you can make $40,000 a year, 3,000 a month, a little over 3,000 a month. And that, you know that you will have enough money for the rest of your life if you have a you know, good advisor, and good investments, et cetera. But that's a comfort zone. People come in and say, well, I need, you know, I need this much. And I say, but 7%. You're not going to have enough money for the rest of your life. A good financial plan will tell you that. We we have computers now that tell tell us that, right? That how much money you're going to have and how long you're. Going to have. It depends if you have a pension that certainly mm -hmm. yeah. um, incorporates social security. Mm -hmm. um, but 
Yeah. So that's not as simple as that, but that's a good rule of thumb. Up. Right. So it depends on your situation. If you have not as many people have pensions today as they had before. Right. So Amy asked the question about when do you take Social Security? I think it's important to know, first of all, are you married? What is your, what is your spouse's Social Security? And if you take it, people come in and they, and, oh, oh, I drive me crazy. Or we're not going to have Social Security, so I'm going to take it at 62. Well, you just are making sure that you are a lot less than you are at age 70. Mm -hmm. So it depends on your situation. My in-laws are very poor, and it's very important they needed the money at 62. And if you don't need it, it's another situation to leave it at uh, my full retirement age is 66. And uh, people now are 66 and a half or 105. <laughs> <laughs> so the situation of when you take Social Security is to look at it and not do the emotional part of it. Right. I want to make sure I have Social Security. Um, my husband and I reviewed his, we reviewed our assets. He died in June, and I think it was Easter, Easter of that year, 2014. And he was so excited to know that he was going to get Social Security because he was sick. So he got it for five months, but he was really excited to know that I would get it. And so now I get, it. I can't believe I'm getting Social Security, but um, <laughs> mine's going to be based on age mm -hmm. 70. I'm deferring mine because I get my husband. So that's, you can't go through the same rules and say, get it at full retirement age. Everybody's situation is different. And I just had a client, they, they called, uh, sent me an email yesterday and said that they don't want to meet at Social Security. Too bad. If you have any kind of an interesting situation, you make an appointment. Even if they say they don't want an appointment, right. you don't need an appointment, you can do it online. Um, yeah. Good, right, yeah, right. thank you. <laughs> good Lord, I like that. Is that you want to meet with the Social Security person because at that meeting, they will give you all the situations. And they'll give you a run. It's really cool. They give this thing and they'll say how much money you'll have. Right. So um, if you take it early, maybe, and I have people I recommend it early because they have bad health. And so you want to get it for the so many number of years ahead of time, uh, 67 or 70 or whatever it is. But it's uh, amazing to me. I have a hundred, I talked to my 102 year old aunt yesterday. And she has a teacher's pension and social security, but she's 102. So if she had taken social security at 62, she'd really be in pain now. So as I said, everybody's situation is different, but also meet with social security. And I'm speaking as a claims rep for social security for 29 years. Okay. It's a month by month reduction. You don't have to be 62, 63, 66, and right now the max is 67 for full retirement age. Is it really? <laughs> Not 105. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a claims representative. Oh, hold on a second. Why don't we give you this so that the, the, the individuals mm -hmm. online can be there? Social Security this month. Yeah, should be. Yeah. Social Security will, it can be a month by month reduction. You don't have to be exactly 62, 64, 65, 66. A claims, claims representative should also tell you the difference. You're giving up so much money per month, but you're picking up, let's say I'm just comparing 62 to 65, you're giving up, you get normally $1,000 a month. If you take it at 62, you're going to get $800 a month. So you're giving up $200 per month forever, ever, and ever. Right. But you're picking up 35 extra checks that you wouldn't have gotten if you had waited. So they will calculate how many years you would be ahead if you took it early versus waiting. And you do get delayed and retirement you, credits. Can you tell the crossover? That break the break They should, yes. They'll calculate the break-even point. What I want to stress is Social Security claims reps are not tax experts. That may affect whatever you receive. Up to 85% of your Social Security benefit could be federally taxable, not for Pennsylvania, not for local. Right? And a client said to me, oh my gosh, 85% tax. That's not what she said. What she's saying is 85, if you get 1000 a month, $850 of it is taxable based on certain mm -hmm. levels of income, mm -hmm. but 850 of it is taxable at your bracket. 
So if you don't pay other income tax or you're in a nursing home or whatever, you might not pay any tax on your social security, or you might have to pay uh, tax at a 40% bracket, you know, based on the person's income. You can also go online. There's two types of estimates that you can get online. One of those estimates, what I want to caution you on, is it projects future earnings. So it looks like you get a higher amount of money if you do that estimate. They have a manual estimate that you can put in. You look at what your earnings are every year, which you can look that up on the SSA.gov website. And then they will calculate, you have to enter that info, but they'll calculate your benefit amount at different ages. They can also have a program to estimate your life expectancy, which again, you're filling in the information for that. Mm. But they have various programs at the SSA.gov website, which can help. And one year when my husband was unemployed, he was a quality engineer. So yeah, it was when a company would lay off people, he was kind of the, that job would go first. Mm -hmm. And he got, he went into unemployment. And it turns out it said that he worked at Miss Trudy's dress shop in Anaheim. <laughs> <laughs> so the importance of what you're talking about on SSA.gov is go in and look and make sure your income is correct. Well, they used to mail it out every year. Well, they yeah. stopped at it. I didn't know six. that because I'm old. But uh, well, they stop. No, they stop mailing that anyway. That when you turn sixty-two, okay. so they won't get it after. Oh, see, I see. I didn't know that, but mm -hmm. I know I used to get it. And you're saying that the estimator to estimate my retirement or something like that mm -hmm. assumes your current income is what you'll have in the future and projecting it, even though you might have stopped working. So you have in the second estimating program, you can say no future earnings. It was always better if somebody would come in with an estimate letter that they got when they were 50, which right. projected earnings up to age 62 and say, but my letter said I was gonna get yeah. this much money, oh, but you didn't yeah. work for the last right. 15 years. Right. And social security looks at 35 years right. worth of your work. The you highest 35. Right. Highest 35 indexed years. Okay. There's an indexing factor for the year that you turn 62. So they take the dollar value of what you earned in the 70s, maybe you were six thousand dollars which was the maximum that you paid social security tax on back at that time but that six thousand dollars might be the equivalent of twenty five thousand dollars now so they index all of your years of earnings then pull out the 35 highest indexed years again if you only had 30 years of work you're going to have five years of zeros so even if you continue to work part-time that could possibly increase your benefit amount maybe only buy a dollar or five dollars a month, but it could increase the pain. And that's important to know. People retire and they're, they're frustrated with their job. They don't like the people they work with or whatever decision it is. They decide at 61 not to work anymore, but that affects their social security. And I think people, I, I really, you know, I don't understand why people would stop their job and then go work at Walmart. But, um, you know, I'm not talking about Walmart per se, you know, I that, that's not that way. Why would I go and maybe want to make ten dollars an hour when I'm making thirty-five dollars an hour right now? So they shouldn't put their job and go live off grid. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> or whatever, because it could affect their social security. So that's what a, a really a good financial advisor will help you with. And one other thing, not related to retirement, but if disability benefits stop at age sixty-five, mm -hmm. so then you're considered it's switched over to the retirement mm -hmm. trust fund. But to file for disability benefits, you have to have 20 quarters of work out of the 40 quarters up right before the time period that you became disabled. So that means you have to have a total of five years worth of work in the 10 year period before you became disabled. Can so you repeat that again? Because that's very important. Okay. If you would, please. You have to have a total of five years worth of work in the 10 year period before you became disabled. If you became disabled at age 50 and you had a total of five years worth of work, 20 quarters of coverage, you can earn four quarters in a year. So between age 40 and 50, you had that five good years worth of work. You could file for disability benefits under social security or off of a spouse's record also in certain situations. But if you didn't work from age 50 to age 60 and then you became disabled, you wouldn't have the work requirement 
So you could be disabled, but you cannot file for disability benefits then. And that I've seen that at housekeepers who became disabled and they didn't pay it. They just, they just took the cash all the time and they didn't file for it. They didn't pay the social security tax. They can't get the disability. The other thing is my husband went in, he went back to work after the first bout of cancer. And so we went in to get social security disability and he did, he wasn't sick long enough, allegedly. You know, there's certain rules of when you can get disability. The cool thing about disability, you can be 57 and they give you what you would be receiving at age 65. Is that correct? Yes. So that I wanted my husband to get that money, you know, based on being 65, but he, he and I can understand he wanted to work so that he didn't think about his cancer all day. So he went back to work. But when he filed, because he wasn't 65, he got less than he would have gotten on a disability. And, and then when I filed on his claim, on his number, I also got less because he wasn't fully disabled. Um, one of the things about disability is that um, after two years, you can be, you can claim for Medicare. So you can be 35 years old on Medicare because you're disabled. So there's some of the nuances that are really important I can, I'll never forget the first year I did income taxes. I worked for H&R Block as a side job for about five years. And people would come in and they'd say, well, we're not married. And, and um, no, it's even more so now, because that was 1995. And, but the, with Social Security as a survivor, the children got Social Security, but the girlfriend did not. Right. Right. But you right. do when, you, when there's somebody, when you're married and there's right. a deceased Perhaps so then you did recognize common law for a period of time, but they don't recognize right. it. Uh, beginning, at, beginning in two, oh. okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> beginning in 2005, uh, Pennsylvania stopped recognizing common law marriages. Oh, so remember. if you had, that means marriages, I need to clarify. Um, there was a case that if you claim to be common law married and that marriage occurred after 2005, it's not a legitimate marriage. I didn't if it was before 2005, then you have to provide the documentation to say, and it's not saying, oh, I mean, it's much more than like, oh, we were together for so many years. No, it, it means that you have to have said to your alleged common law spouse, I consider you my husband and he considers you his wife. It has to be present tense that you're saying, I'm treating you as my husband or wife. It doesn't matter if you live together forever um, and that you hold yourselves out. There's, it's very factual as well. The common law marriages can be very hard to prove. So it's a good thing we got rid of them because it's, you, you know, can't be married for one thing and not married for something else. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And then you have to be free to be married. You have to have been free. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, I mean, if you're still married, it's because polygamy is not legal in Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah. I don't think it's legal in any of the 50 states. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Um, when considering what age I'm going to retire at and when I can start taking my Social Security, should I be concerned? That if I wait till 67, that there's not going to be Social Security here? Like, I hear a lot. Well, that's uh, certainly that's well, my I, comment when I was saying that people would get to be The question is, um, you know, when determining when you should begin taking Social Security, when you should retire, should um, one of the factors in that consideration be like, there might not be Social Security when you retire? And Sarah? And I, and that, yes, there'll be Social Security. Uh, I mean, with the child tax credit and all the other things that are just coming out of Washington, can you imagine in a voting, our senators in right. the House of Representatives yeah. would stop Social Security? So when somebody says that to me, I said, well, at our age, maybe we have to worry about it for our 20 year old grandchildren or children, but you certainly don't have to worry about it when you're 60 or 62. So we're going to have Social Security for a, for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. Well, we've all paid into it. Yeah, yeah I, I think the fact, and Jill, correct me if, if uh, I'm wrong, most people collect a whole lot more than they contributed. Within two and a half years is the average. Is what You'll get is? back within two and a half years what you paid in your whole life. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, so, I'm a little I'm more pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lot more pessimistic. pessimistic too. Um, so if you are younger, I mean, if you are concerned about that, 
I would say put that as one of your considerations. Let Sarah and Kelly know if you are concerned about that, because taking somebody's word for it, but then still worrying, is it going to give you peace of mind? Um, you know, I have a lot of people saying I'm taking it at 62 because I want to make sure I get it. Well, you're going to get your money back in two and a half years. And if you live to be 90, you're going to regret. Most people who regret, regret it because it's at a lower, you know, it, they should have waited until they were full retirement age. And that's uh, what we look at financially. Sometimes emotionally, they just want or, or need to take it. Um, yeah, just because they're, they're and just because secure Sarah it. says in the office we joke about it. Sarah says, Sarah says. <laughs> Sarah says that's the way it's supposed to be. But the whole idea is, and I have people who retire all the time, but they don't take their social security until they're 67. Mm -hmm. Because they put a pot of money aside. I know I'm going to have to put twenty thousand dollars aside because that's the money I'm going to live on until I get my social security. So that's part of the planning process. How are you going to live if you retire at 65? A lot of people wait, they're excited and they want to retire. And the number has to be now at 65 because you get Medicare. Right. That seems to be. I know when Mrs. Clinton was running for president, she wanted to have Medicare at 55. Oh. And, yeah, right. <laughs> at 55. And as someone who just went on Medicare, it's kind of it's different at, when you're from an employment plan. But, but my point is, is that you know, people seem to me, be retiring at 65 because of Medicare, because Obamacare um, uh, or ACA is so expensive. But you can file for Medicare and not file for your benefits. Correct. So right. your, yeah. The comment was you can file for Medicare, but not file for Social Security <clears throat> benefits. Also, Social Security planning depends on your situation. Are you <laughs> single? Are you married? Um, as Sarah said, uh, are you ill? You know, then you'd want to take Social Security sooner rather than later. If um, you are sure your spouse will outlive you um, and his or her social security is less than yours and you can wait to take it um, at age 70, that amount grows between your full retirement age and age 70, 8% a year. Then if you would pass, um, having um, waited to take the, the maximum amount you can take, then your social security amount becomes hers. It's technically some of both of yours, right? The calculation, but um, something to consider. And two, and, uh, we'll get to questions, I'm sorry. Two times in my career has it been very sad because again, taking your pension, people say to me, when should I take my pension? Should I take it? In, um, it was Mrs. Marino that changed it that the spouse has to go along with what the other spouse takes as a pension. So uh, an example, if I'm married and mm -hmm. I want to take my whole pension, mm -hmm. my husband has to, would have to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. Before then, a lot of particularly men would just take their full pension and then they <laughs> die three years later and their spouse doesn't get that. And that happened to me twice in my career that a, a colonel, took his full military pension, thinking that he was 55 and he was going to live for a lot of years. Well, he did his point made it and he died at 60. And this poor woman had no pension. And then the other one was, it was an Armstrong retiree. His wife had been ill most of the marriage. He took his full pension because she was ill. <laughs> he died four months later. And so she doesn't have a pension. So that's a, as, as important as Social Security is, it's also important how you do your pension. And the hardest thing I think is to know when you're going to die. You know, my well, husband, yeah. I, I don't know the answer, right? Yeah. Tell us when you're going to die. We can tell you when you tell exactly how to take your money, right? right? But the sadness is, is that when my father was a smoker, he died at 89, and my mother is still living. And so I assume as a 102 year old man, I'm going to live a long time. But I might not. Mm -hmm. So it's really important with the spouse is how the survivor is going to, to live um, if you take how you're going to take your benefits of the retiring and so forth. A 401k you can plan on because you know the person's going to get it and you can take out uh, more than you need, but but you can't do that with pension. Once you decide it, once you decide social security, I think you can re-change re it the first year. But up to the first year after that, you can't. You well, you could it. if you repay that yeah. everything that you received and then refile. 
So if you withdraw your application, you have to repay everything. Hmm. Well, let's get in here. I just want to repeat what she just said. Mm -hmm. That with regard to Social Security, if you want to redo your amount that you're receiving, you would have to repay everything you've received and then refile. Um, so, and we had two questions. Yes, yeah. And then we'll, um, we'll probably end up Italy. going to break. Right mm -hmm. Yes, you. Well, this was a Sarah says statement. So I wanted you to explain a little bit further. Okay. Unless I misheard you, you said 403Bs upon retirement can be rolled over into an IRA. Yes. I guess I just want to know the why of that. Like, why would you want to do that? For the investment choices. Okay. For the 403B, and, and uh, certainly Kelly can talk, to, talk about that, is that your employer has chosen as the trustee what kind of investments you could be in. And so they don't have individual bonds, you know, and, and they have the bond funds, they have maybe CDs inside the 403B. But by rolling it over and consolidating, first of all, consolidation is very important to me, I think so. Control, this is just talking about control. control. Sarah loves control. But the um, <laughs> but you have more investment choices by having it in an IRA with an investment advisor. Yeah, that's yeah, why you just simplify, you know, so like we were talking for a three day within the hospital that I work, for example, Prudential, and, and we do have the ability within Prudential to determine where the money goes. So if we have that option, it's not as critical. Are you saying as far as a Prudential versus Fidelity versus? I think it's important as to how, the, she's talking about why she could keep it at Prudential. Um, we, if we get, just make sure that the question has to do with if you have a 401k or a 403b, is it best, which is better? Do you keep it in that plan that your employer had or to roll it over into an IRA? And Sarah is addressing the and we're talking about once you're retired. Yes. 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 So, um, and the uh, hospital guy at Prudential is very good at keeping the money there. And, um, and I think that's fine. It depends on whether you're asked to pay for it or not. That's another consideration. <clears throat> I think Luther Acres, they, they don't, retirees don't have to even, they're still not paying for their benefits for the care of the 401 or 403B there. And I think that's a wonderful thing that the nursing home or the retirement home is paying for the fees for that. Because most of the, a lot of times the employer is paying the fees until you retire. Mm -hmm. And then at that time you have to pay. So are you paying more or less than you would be paying with a financial advisor or on your own? So there are all the questions. There's a form now that we have to use in the office through the Department of Labor. Does it make sense to me? Um, does it make sense to roll the money over? I have to explain to my compliance officer if I roll over your Prudential 403B, I have to explain to my compliance officer who has to put on record for the government, does it make sense for you to move it or not? You can it's... discuss all the fees that you would be paying currently versus if the money was invested um, with Sarah or me or any other financial advisor. So there's Same not a tax advantage one way or the other. No, because it would it's just move tax, over with on choice. So it's called a trustee to trustee transfer. Mm -hmm. So if you're leaving Prudential as a trustee or the, the hospital as a trustee and you bring it to Schwab and uh, RKL Wealth Management, we move it directly over from uh, Prudential to Schwab and it's a trustee to trustee transfer. You're allowed to do that innumerable times. You know, come to Schwab and you're not happy, you can move it to Morgan Stanley. But if you take, um, uh, if you can only, you can't take out of an IRA and put it back in that within, people can do it within 60 days, you can take it out and then put it back in. And it's not a taxable event. The problem is you can only do that once a year. And so I see that very rarely, but I see people go trustee to trustee all the time. The, the only reason I see it where they take it out and then later put it back in <clears> is if they need some of the money for a very short period of time mm -hmm. and then are able to put it back into the IRA. But it gives me the EDG. It does. <laughs> the nine times out of 10, it's That's not enough more. time and then they end up paying tax on the whole, the whole amount. And, uh, and one of the questions on a 403B, a 401K withdrawal from the office, you're required, they're required to have a 20% withholding on it. But if, if you, you take it, 
distribution, not a transfer. Mm -hmm. But if you transfer it or you are retired and have it in an IRA, you don't have to pay tax on it, or you can pay something different than 20%. Now I have clients who are paying, they're in the 32% bracket. So we take out 32% when their IRA is distributed, when they take uh, distribution from it. Or, um, or they're in the 10% <coughs> tax bracket. We only have to take 10% out rather than the 20% that's required when it's from a firm. So you can leave it in the 403B, you can roll it into an IRA if you wanna simplify and have different options. Um, you know, it's totally up to you. Okay. Are there any other questions about what we've just discussed that are quick? Because yes, we're, we're coming up on the baby to get us take a break. <laughs> You're identified as wealth management. Now, does that mean you have to have a minimum amount of assets before you can go into a financial planner? Or an it advisor? depends on the firm. Each firm, yeah, that you, you know that from the So agency. you would ask them first, what is your minimum? That's part of the question. Mm -hmm. I would ask them for the, the first meeting. Okay. The, and, and what... It, the difference between an investment advisory firm and a wealth management firm is the wealth management, you get a financial plan that's part of the package. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why Kelly's wealth management as well, because you do the financial plan, you talk about income taxes, how is this going to affect my taxes? Do I understand the tax liability of this or this or this? So wealth management looks at everything. We make sure that the chair, where should the charitable distributions come from? An investment advisory firm will just look at the pot of money that they are taking care of. And firms and advisors can do things completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, Sarah and um, another advisor in her office, I mean, they'll do a plan and all, but they, they could invest your money um, very differently. You know, so um, you just have to be comfortable with the person you choose and how, you know, they invest your money. I mean, what, what I mean by that is um, some advisors um, might not be CFPs and they would just have um, a person in the back office do a financial plan for you. Fine, you still have the financial plan. Um, however, uh, then the advisor isn't as involved in the plan. I always find it's easier if I'm preparing the plan to really understand the client better. But um, then I could, my, my partner and I have a model how we invest um, our clients' money um, based on you know, their age and risk tolerance. The, the advisor in the office next to me might just use mutual funds. Um, the advisor down the hall might hire a money manager, a portfolio manager, like I am, you probably are as well, to pay a fee to, to manage the money. So um, you just need to know, you know what type of individual you feel comfortable with, or at least understand how they're going to approach managing your money and monitoring your financial plan. But it seems forward. you need to know, have a general idea of what your wealth is in order to know what firm you could go to. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. Um, I think we're, we're very similar in, in how we work together. Different advisors, um, younger advisors, quite honestly, um, would work with clients with um, much, a much smaller pool of assets. Um, and so you might not need the expertise you know, of somebody with um, more years of experience in CFP designation. Um, but everyone will tell you um, if they have a minimum, what it is, and, you know, before you, you know, approach. Um, before we take a break, I just want to make one comment about the reverse mortgages in case we don't get there, but with the health or home equity conversion mortgage and a reverse mortgage, I've looked it up, and a HECA, the home equity conversion mortgage, is the same thing as a reverse mortgage, except it's guaranteed by um, FHA, whereas other reverse mortgages wow. are not the government's okay. program. So in essence, it's the same thing. It's just a matter of who's insuring the program. So, so a reverse mortgage is not backed up by anybody? Oh, no, it's, it's not backed up by the government. It's not backed oh. up by FHA. Got it. It's still backed up, but it's not by FHA. Okay, got it. Kind of like uh, mortgage or mortgage. Plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can I just ask one of, is there anything that is a simple like checklist of what I would need to do for homework before I would go to um, a financial planner? As in, I do have checklists that we can send out, but quite honestly, I see a state planning checklist. I print it almost every time we do this seminar, okay. and I don't go over it. Um, so okay. 
what um because i feel like i need to do homework before i go oh yeah <laughs> well you don't <laughs> have to you don't have to but it costs well i know right, right right by being prepared right with the list of your assets with the beneficiaries i think people are just designation the beneficiary designation i think is one of the worst things. All that. yeah and it doesn't cost you less with, with us there's no, no, no fair will it's just my often assets. i'll just have a phone call um that could okay. last an hour mm -hmm. just to gather information and go from, from there, then you go out and, mm. you know, look at, you know, what type of life insurance policy do I need you to have. Do I need to know my expenses? Yes, my but we can expenses? help you, you know, back into that if, if you don't have a budget. Yeah. Um, well, I, I jokingly, I used to write for a, a newspaper here in Hempfield, in Hempfield. And I said, quick and save my marriage. My husband would go to the ATM and he'd just take money out. And at the end, at the end of the month, I would say, I see all these things. But knowing your expenses is really, really important. And a lot of us don't. Mm -hmm. That's whatever's in our checkbook, we know we can spend. And so it doesn't have to be a quick end to know that how much I pay for my mortgage or my property oh, taxes, okay. et cetera. But you should know what you're spending. And so you certainly need to know that when you go to see a financial planner. And before. you can look at what you have left over at the end of the month, you know, right. from your income. So there are easy ways that but when Kelly doesn't that. care that you spend ten thousand in property taxes or five thousand as a planner. She just wants to know that you're not we just uh, we met with somebody in the suite. to say shoes. Is <laughs> I, I get frustrated when somebody comes in and they, they want a financial plan when they're not they're spending more than they make. And I have an 80 year old to pay. They just are refinancing their property again because they're not they're spending too much. It's just very sad. But I don't think they have control of it. Yes, okay. I think Dee, is there know. anything else online before we close down this? Um, there's somebody who, who just shared that they have a social security question that's too complicated to type. So they, they but maybe we come back to that yeah, let's after come the back break. To that after break. So we're, we're gonna start with um, long-term care planning. And I'll start talking about the different types of long-term care insurance. And uh, then we'll talk about smart life and um, we'll, we'll all have some input um, on the topic. So it used to be there was just a traditional long-term care insurance policy that you could buy that you paid the premium for every year. You had to set different parameters like waiting period, how uh, long the benefit would be paid for, if it was um, a daily or a monthly benefit, um, if there was a, a cost of living rider on it, you know, many things like that to determine um, the, the price of the policy. And you would pay it every year. And uh, clients would often say, well, if I don't need it, I'm paying this premium, which is a substantial premium compared to other insurance policies. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I lose it. And we would always say, well, you pay insurance, fire insurance on your home too, and you don't want your home to burn down, uh, right? And uh, so that, that was all we had for many years. Now there are um, hybrid policies in addition um, to that type of coverage where you can have a life insurance policy with a critical care or long-term care rider on it. If you don't use um, the long-term care portion of it, it just goes to your heirs as life insurance. Um, there are also um, hybrid policies where you can um, contribute a lump sum and that can be um, contributed you know, over five or seven or 10 years, but a lump sum of money that then equates to a pool of money used for long-term care. And um, it's similar to the original policy in that um, it's over a certain number of years, often it's six years, it's a certain amount per month, um, and uh, it'll have some sort of an inflation rider, very similar. But if you don't use it for long-term care insurance, it too goes to your heirs um, as life insurance. Um, so those types of policies, you need a substantial amount to put in as a premium, either um, as a lump sum or over you know, five to 10 years to equate to a, a, a large enough pool to use for long-term care. Oftentimes I'll see clients who have inherited money that they didn't expect to inherit um, you know, buy a long-term care policy like that. Um, if you already have um, 
an insurance policy, not a term policy, but permanent insurance, um, you can actually convert it to a policy with a long-term care rider if it doesn't already have one, if, if you're in good health, um, and use it uh, that way. Someone mentioned HSAs, which are health savings accounts, and um, they are different from flexible spending accounts or FSAs. While, while you're working, you can um, each year put so much in a flexible spending account, but if you don't use it all, you lose it at the end of that year, and it starts over again the next year. An HSA, um, it carries forward, and you can even have you know, a substantial pool of money when you retire and use that for health insurance expenses in retirement. And then you're, you're basically paying for health insurance expenses tax-free. Now with the HSA though, that is only available to you if you are on a qualified high deductible insurance plan. Right. Um, because my former employer had a high deductible insurance plan and now I'm with my husband's and they don't have a qualified high deductible plan. So I can only do the FSA, I can't do the HSA. Um, so it's, it's going to be contingent upon whatever type of plan you have, but if you can do the, uh, if you do have the high deductible, taking advantage of the SSA, or HSA, I'll put that soup this morning, yeah. um, then, um, then you're, you should do so because it does have that, um, you know, your, it's, um, it's before tax funds that are being set aside, and if you don't use them, you still get to keep them. So it's important for you to know if you have a long-term care policy or you're thinking about a long-term care policy that you know what you have. Because a lot of it, particularly the older, older policies, there's 95 and a lot of that policy 50 years ago, they have to be in the hospital for three days before they get benefits. So, and today I just had a client, he's now nursing home, home benefits, not nursing home benefits on the policy. I have somebody at home status, he was on, um, I, I didn't even forget the word, Kathy might know it, that observation, that's the word. Mm -hmm. they, he was observed at the hospital mm -hmm. and he was not admitted. Mm -hmm. So the policy isn't going into effect. effect. Mm -hmm. So there's some of the things you need to know when you when you, uh, ask the person who's talking to you about long-term care planning and a policy is to know all the nuances to it. Yeah, and, and you know, one policy um, may not compare at all to another. I remember one client, I had um, prepared a quote for a long-term care insurance policy with a client and they brought me a, another quote that they got somewhere else and the amount of premium was very different. Um, the company I had used, um, it was much higher. Well, when I looked into the quote from the lower premium, it um, kept the uh, premium constant just for a short period of years and then the older the client got the higher the premium increased and so when they're living on fixed income you know their premium is going up much more now saying that all long-term care policies that were written in the last 10 years annually it seems have had uh, premium increases now hopefully that the newer policies um, they may have started out with higher premiums, but maybe won't have such drastic premium increases because that the insurance um, department and insurance companies just didn't uh, plan well as far as what the expenses on these policies would be. And then they have to go to the insurance department and request an increase in premium for the entire group that owned a specific contract, but um, they usually get approval and, and we certainly have been seeing the premium increases. And I called the insurance commissioners in, in Harrisburg and I asked them why are they now, uh, John Hancock had a 70% increase in their premium. And 70% um, for heaven's sake, now they hadn't raised it at all ever. But Harrisburg said, well, they consider that medical insurance and they're going to permit the increase. So that's why you, you need to find out about the policies, the premiums, et cetera. And there are a lot of insurance companies that have gotten out of that. There's business. no standardization. Is that what you're saying in terms of the no, policies? company by company. Company right. by company. And, right. and but, maybe this plan here had a 180 day waiting period. Right, it's like comparing and apples compared to, to oranges. Nine, I mean, yeah, 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 so you just have to be yeah. aware right. um, and, and be careful about it. 
when we do a financial plan for clients, um, we take that into consideration. If they already have a, a policy, we include the premium in one of their, their goals because that's something that they are going to want to continue paying throughout their lifetime. If they don't have a policy, maybe they know that they wouldn't qualify because of health reasons for a policy, um, then I'll often talk with them about, um, about their health and their life expectancy, and then we'll choose um, an age to say, okay, let's, let's say at age 85, you may spend three years in a nursing facility and base it on current costs and increase it for inflation and see how that affects their overall plan. And that's how it affects the, the uh, change of premium to mm -hmm. the increased premium. If you have inflation uh, mm -hmm. a rider that allows it to go up 5% a year, which, because that's what part of the policy is. Another is um, for the light. And it's my understanding, I was told it has to do with the underwriting or the company putting it on the books. Like I just had a person, she was on long-term care insurance for 10 years because she had unlimited for her life. But they nowadays the premium is so much higher if you take it for your for your life. I don't know if they even write Why that anymore. Yeah. I tell her they don't have that to do that, but five or seven years max now for mm -hmm. long-term care. So let's talk about smart life a little bit. Um but yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, just one of the things that um, I just wanted to bring up, we're going to be talking about a lot of things, and there may be an area that we don't cover, but if you do have an interest in that, please be sure to put it on your um, on your survey, and I'm sure Amy will talk about this at the end, but if there's something we're not covering, just make a note of it and put them in your survey, because we do look at those when we're determining um, other seminars that we uh, want to plan for. Um, we have the fall series, and, and there had been a spring series because of COVID, but we look at people, what they want to hear about and um, so if we talk about Medicaid planning and we don't get into as much detail um, lots of times we will have a separate standalone seminar for that where you can learn more about it so I just wanted to put that out there so that if there's something we don't cover that you um, would like to hear about or think it's important please let us know okay now with the long-term care planning we we're talking about different ways to pay for your nursing home care um, and you know if you're healthy um, and relatively young, absolutely look into um, long-term care insurance. And Kelly, what was it you always used to say? Like you're never as young and a young never as young and healthy as you are today, supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think you get younger as we get older. So I mean, so um, when they're determining premiums, lots of times it's based upon your age and your health. Um, and then um, we'll talk about Medicaid last because that is a payer of last resort. Um, but the smart life that someone had brought up is something that while you're relatively healthy because with long-term care insurance and smart life, there are health assessments that are done to determine whether or not you can qualify um, and then how much your monthly uh, amount will be. And Sarah, you were gonna start talking about smart life? So smart life, so smart life yeah, the initial premium that you pay premium, it really is, is that it's based on your age. So doing it at 65 is cheaper than at 70. The last time I had a client who was 70, um, it was $60,000 for each spouse to dump into the new building and use smart life. Then I think it was 600, 60, 650 a month or something like that. And you pay that forever, mm -hmm. but they promise you that you will be able, the one that I had, that Will and Valerie will take you into nursing. And so it's wonderful. My negative about smart life is somebody still has to run the house. You know, you stay in your home and you stay in your home until you go to nursing. So assisted living or even independent living, somebody has to decide about doing the leaves in the fall, mm -hmm. right? What happens if the furnace goes out today? Now, when I call the question for a guy called smart life, they have a list of contractors who will, they recommend to come and to use. But the, the, the thing about going into, my mom's at St. Anne's in independent living, is that she knows that if she needs to, she'll go to their assisted living and she'll and, and she can go there as much as needed. And then she'll go into nursing hopefully it's never needed. But it's a continuing care facility and she'll go down the path. Yeah. The smart life, you know that you will be going to um, the nursing home and the rest of the time you will be in your home. Yeah. So and you don't have to pay 
more for the nursing Correct. Home. So the nursing home will be five hundred dollars a day or four fifty a day, which is the right amount of price. It's about five hundred dollars a day. You'll continue to pay the six fifty for the rest of your life with that premium increases or whatever. So it's a lot cheaper than if you uh, just go into a nursing home. But all the my negative about Smart Life because it's a lot of positives with it is that you have to have somebody to be able to help you with your home because you are in your home. So maybe going into an apartment or something else would be a reason for, to look at Smart Life. But like everything, I tell everybody, there are pros and cons to everything in life, but marriage, children, um, seminars, et cetera. And, you know, you have pros and cons, write them down and say what your worries are. And um, I do have to say, I have a personal experience with Smart Life. Um, one of my friends from actually probably first grade kindergarten had called me about her mom and it didn't occur to me, but she was actually um, involved with establishing Smart Life at Willow mm -hmm. Valley. And so her mom had been in a nursing home and for whatever reason, I didn't make that connection. I'm like, oh, you know, we got to think about you know, Medicaid planning and those things. She's like, oh, no, no, lost that smart life. So it made it a whole lot easier because right now she's in um, skilled care, but because she has smart life, she's paying that five or six hundred dollars a month. And as Sarah said, you know, like someone's got to take care of those other things, but also keep in mind that you're paying a whole lot less for that monthly fee than you would if you were going into assisted living and you were paying the then going rate. Um, so when you're looking at nursing homes, you have to look at how are they charging? Right. Um, is it a pay as you go? Is it, do you have buy-in? How much is the buy-in? Does that buy-in then get used to pay for your care when you run out of money? Or is it sort of like a, a life care plan like at Willow Valley where you pay a large buy-in and you pay a monthly fee for no matter what level of care you receive? But that monthly fee is more than you would pay for smart life. So you sort of have to think about how much money are you saving and versus if you're looking at it from a financial perspective. But if you don't have somebody who can help take care of those things, then clearly staying at home is going to be more of a burden. Um, and I, I was surprised to find out I have a client, um, 95, 96 year old person at Blues um, Acres, and he assumed that when he put into the buy in to get into that, he was sure that that was coming back to his family. Well, when I looked at the contract, it's not coming well, back. You had a different choice. Right. I just looked at Willow Valley for me and for what I wanted, and my children get nothing back. It's five hundred thousand dollars, and so now I'm young, and it's going to be for a long time. Do I really want to pay that five hundred thousand? My mom and dad paid twenty five thousand to go to St. Anne's. That's it. Now the price goes up. Willow Valley is the same price for every level of care, oh. and so that's pretty awesome, particularly if you're there for a long time. But my mom has a certain amount a month, and then if she goes to assisted living, it's higher. Mm -hmm. And if she goes to nursing, it's higher. And so they're the considerations that you need to think about when you're- Especially when, when it's a couple, because if, if you have continuing care, but not life care, then one needs nursing care, and the other is in um, independent living or assisted living, you're paying for both. Mm -hmm. um, where um, with life care, you're not, even though you're two different places, it stays the same. And that's the important thing when you're looking to get to a retirement community. Um, it's important to look at what types of services that they provide. Is it a standalone personal care? So you've got independent living and then you've got personal care, which is it's sort of like in between that and skilled care. So then you have the skilled nursing care. But then does the facility that you're going to have all the different levels? What happens when you run out of money? Even if it does have all of the levels, do they guarantee that you'll get a bed? Or what if there's not a bed available at that facility? Do they find a bed for you in the meantime somewhere else? And so um, those contracts can be very complicated. Um, and so if you have questions, I highly recommend that you seek legal advice on that. Because, um, you, you know, the person who's explaining it to you, it doesn't matter how they explain it to you. It's what's in that contract, knowing who's responsible. Um, and also, if you're signing for a family member or someone else um, as their power of attorney, there are specific ways that I have my clients sign, um, you know, such as, no, you're never signing as the responsible party. You're signing on behalf of the resident as their agent under the power of attorney. Um, if that's what you are. So 
There are just lots of different things you need to be careful about. And most facilities offer different types of buy-ins. I mean, there's a hybrid. Some could be an amortized uh, declining return. Some could be X percent. So, um, and it's just like long-term care insurance. You can't just compare this facility to that facility. You really have to look at the bells and whistles um, and the requirements that are in each of the contracts. And then people come in and ask me, which is the best way to do it, Sarah? And so we run the numbers, I'm sure Kelly does that too, is that you run the numbers as is to the best place. Now, uh, when, when Kim was talking, I thought of two things. One is have your name into a re the retirement place that you want to go. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a stroke or whatever, like it's very hard to go to Lou Gregor's because they have such a, a long waiting list. But they took my mother-in-law because, and she really was upset at me because one year for Christmas, <laughs> I paid for her to sign up to go to Luther Acres. Mm -hmm. It was non-refundable, Sarah. And she was right. I mean, it was, but, and, and, but anyway, it was only $250, $5,000 today. But my point is, is I got her where she wanted to go. But if you wait for the social workers when you're in the hospital after having a stroke, they will put you where the beds are available. Right. right. And there are, there are some nursing homes, unfortunately, where I would not want to send mm -hmm. my enemy, mm -hmm. let alone a beloved my dog. I always said I wouldn't put my dog in that home. And so that's okay. one of the things. Too. So pick that out for your children. Pick out where you want to go. Is it Homestead Village? Is it Moravian Manor? Is it Luther Acres? Is it Willow Valley? You decide where you want to go so that they know where you want to go and you have it all set up. And if you've decided where you might want to go, that's helpful for Kelly and Sarah because they can look at your assets and as part of your financial plan, help you to plan for that buy-in or those monthly expenses. The other thing, and one, uh, one other thing I wanted to say about the insurance policies and that is make sure that it covers home health care because most of us want to stay home as long as we can. Um, some of the old policies didn't cover that. Most of the new ones do, but oftentimes too in the contract, they'll say that you don't have um, to meet the waiting period for home health care. And then if you go from home health care into nursing, they'll waive uh, the waiting period. And due to Medicaid, but also because the home, will, most homes will guarantee that they will keep you through life, is that once you are in a facility mm -hmm. like that, you can't do your annual gifting. They don't want you to give the gifting away because you won't qualify for Medicaid if you run out of money. And that's where the language of the contract comes in because I had just listened, uh, I had just uh, attended a seminar, uh, a continu continuing legal education seminar where we were talking about um, continuing care retirement communities and the contracts and what is in that admissions contract is so important. Um, and even attorneys who write them or the nursing homes are always revamping them. Like, you know, what are you disclosing? Are you disclosing everything or do you only have to disclose enough to get in? And if you say you're not gifting. So it's important to understand that that is a very, very important document. I can't emphasize enough because just because you think it's in there, if it's not in there, it's, it's always the language. So making sure that you know what the contract says. Is there are important. actually many um, homes that won't, Provide care if you live out with your money, correct? Yeah, yeah. And and um, I, Amy wants us to keep moving, but I there's one other thing I wanted to talk about. With a lot of the homes now are requiring an annual statement of your finances. And and uh, you know if I have somebody with five million dollars, I get a little offended about that every year because they're they're not going to run out of money. <laughs> but I can understand there are a lot of people who are so that you have to be prepared to to uh, give a financial statement every year as to your assets. They want to know, they have to plan for if they're going to take care of you under uh, oh. Medicaid. Lots of, lots of times there are facilities that even though they, they don't guarantee that they will keep you, the idea is that most of them, especially those that are religiously or faith-based, that they will keep you provided you haven't given away your assets. So the reason that they want that annual statement is that if you come in saying you have so much money, and then next year, you've got $250,000 less than that. They're going to be like, oh, what are you doing with it? And why are my charitable benevolence dollars being used to pay for your care when you're giving away your money that should have been used for your care? So I think they just make it across the board. Everybody has to hand it in because that's the reason. Right. Um, and, you know, um, if somebody doesn't qualify for Medicaid, 
Um, then you're looking at the facility's benevolence plan. And so once again, why should somebody else be paying for your care if you've given away your money that should have been saved for your care? Now, with the Medicaid, I said that's a payer of last resort. Medicaid is a welfare program. It's needs-based. So you have to qualify financially in order to receive the benefit as well as medically. So Medicaid dollars are only going to cover the cost of skilled nursing care. So that's 24-7 skilled nursing care. Medicaid does not pay for personal care. Um, and Medicaid, um, there's a waiver program that can pay for some um, in-home health care uh, and needs. But there are slightly different qualification requirements, actually a little more lenient than it is for nursing home care Medicaid. Um, so when you're thinking long-term care planning, how are you gonna pay for that? The earlier you start, the better. And not, I'm not saying like start at 50 or even 60, but you know your health, you know what may be coming up to the extent that you do know, try to plan ahead because um, we can do crisis Medicaid planning when somebody's like, oh my gosh, they have to go, and then what do we do? Um, there are some um, protections that you may lose if you wait too long to play it. So and I'm telling you, people do it all the time. My husband or my father just went into a nursing home. Well, it's too late. You know, you have to make the planning right. beforehand. If there are things that you want to do, and there are options that, that the statutes allow for, for doing certain things with your assets, but the longer you wait, the more restrictions there are. So how Medicaid works is um, in the event that you have run out of money um, and there are different requirements if you're married or if you're an individual, but basically you need to require skilled nursing care. And if you're a single individual, depending on the amount of your monthly income, we'll decide how far you have to spend your assets down. So if it's over, I think about $2,500 a month is your gross income, not whatever you receive net from your pension. Um, and it's not what you receive from Social Security because they want the gross amount. So that includes adding back in your Medicare premiums that automatically come out from your Social Security. If it's um, the amount's about $2,500, if you have income of more than $2,500 a month, then you can only keep $2,400 of assets. Now, if your income is less than that, you can keep up to $8,000 and still qualify. And they allow you to pay for your funeral. So, but so, so it's like you spend down, but there are exemptions. There are exempt assets that you can have. One of those would be a prepaid funeral account. Now, in order to have the prepaid in your funeral, it must be irrevocable because if there's any possibility you can take that money out, it's not, it's not going to be exempt. The idea of it being exempt is the government wants you to be able to pay for your own funeral, but those funds have to be used to pay for your funeral. So there are a couple of different ways of prepaying for funerals, such as you pay the money there, you lock in the cost, they cut your money, and then typically what the funeral home must do is either purchase a life insurance policy to guarantee it, or they put it into a specific type of trust. But if you, when you're prepaying to lock in at whatever that then rate is, you have to pay for your entire funeral. Sometimes you can finance it over several months, but it has to be paid in full. Another option would be setting aside, like, all right, you know, like, all right, well, if the spouse just passed away or a family member and their funeral total costs $11,000, you might want to put away $12,000, but you have to put it into an irrevocable type of burial account. Um, it means it can only be paid to the funeral home when you die. So, that if you do that, then that is an exempt resource. You won't have to spend it down in order to qualify for Medicaid. So you could have spent down to the $8,000 and you have a $15,000 prepaid funeral account. Well, you're going to qualify because that funeral account does not count as a resource that they want you to liquidate. Um, the bottom line, don't try to do this on your own. Right? <laughs> right, right. No, it and terrifying. so with the prepaid funeral accounts, you know, um, the thing is, it's for Medicaid purposes, there is an allowance, and that varies by county. So depending on what county you live in and what county you will be applying to for medical assistance if you run out of funds, will determine how much, because the costs for burial are more expensive in Philadelphia County than, let's say, they would be in 
Cuyahoga County or something. So the amounts are slightly different, um, but that's just something that you would find out. Um, but when, when um, qualifying for Medicaid or planning ahead for that, if you are married, there are different um, times that when you wanna spend down the resources, because if you are married and you have a spouse that's not in skilled care, we call that the community spouse, um, they're going to look at the date you entered skilled care, the, the institutionalized spouse. When that spouse enters skilled care, we're going to take a snapshot of all of your resources, whether they're titled individually or jointly. And then what we're going to do is we'll look to see, are there certain exempt resources? So if that could be coming up, there are ways that we would recommend, okay, because a community spouse's retirement plans are exempt, we would want to try to protect the community spouses, not use as much, take only what distributions you have to, and maybe we take more from the institutionalized spouses. So there are certain things we would do, like which assets should you keep, which assets should you spend down to maximize how much that community spouse can exempt and then also keep. So that snapshot date with a married couple, we're going to look at the total amount and then typically of those counted resources and divide it in half. And the community spouse can keep, because this number changes on a regular basis, the maximum amount that a community spouse can keep is $130,380. And what would you want that to be all that you have as a community spouse? That's why it's so important to have a long-term care policy if you can, because I would not want to be 68 years old and have only $130,000 for the next 35 years of my life. That's more than you need for medical expenses. That's so right. let's just let's just stop there and see if we have any questions about long-term care insurance or Medicaid planning, and then we'll go on to another topic. And there are certain financial advisors, and obviously she's a good as the attorney who knows about Medicaid planning. You just can't walk into the attorney who takes care of your company's business law and ask them about Medicaid plan. Because, and also, as they're saying, with the Medicaid planning, if you are married, there are different considerations because sometimes we will plan to disinherit the spouse that is in the nursing home. We can't completely disinherit, but we can reduce the amount that will go to that surviving spouse. So when it's a married couple, um, there are a lot more considerations. And one more thing with regard to the Medicaid, you will hear like, oh, we're going to do a five-year look back. So that five-year look back is 60 months. And when you complete that application, you're saying within the 60 months preceding the date of the application, whether or not you have made any gifts or what we call transfers for less than fair consideration, you have to disclose that. So selling your $200,000 house to your child for a dollar is not their consideration. In that case, you would have made a $199,999 gift. And gifts um, can create problems. Um, it would just qualify you from Medicaid benefits for a considerable period of time. And just to keep in mind right now, how we would determine that ineligibility period would be, you take the amount of the gift that was made during that last 60 months and you divide it by the average daily cost of skilled nursing care in Pennsylvania, which is $364.90. So then that number you get is the number of days that you will not receive Medicaid benefits. So nursing homes, when you're gonna apply for admission, they're asking you, have you made any transfers for less than fair value in the last 60 months? And you disclose it. And then the nursing home will look at what assets do you have, how long will that last, or how will that gift affect us. There are exceptions to not being disqualified, but those are very hard to come by. So my advice would be either <coughs> we're thinking that at any point in time during the next five years, it's reasonable to believe that you may need nursing home care. Do not make a gift without seeking professional advice because if you run out of money and you have to apply for Medicaid and you made a gift, who's going to pay for your care? And in Pennsylvania, we do have a law um, that allows uh, nursing homes to sue your children to pay for your nursing care in certain situations. 
Now, how those have worked out tend to be, well, if your child has taken money from you or if they've gifted money um, that has caused you to not qualify for medical assistance. However, I don't have a whole lot of faith um, that Medicaid is going to be something that's going to be here forever the way it currently is because it is such a huge part of budgets. Um, and, you know, I just don't bank on that. Um, if you're in that situation, absolutely buy buy it. But for long term, you want to be smarter in planning for your long term care and how you're going to pay for it. And I had a client who did not he did not get Medicaid because he had given away fifty his pastor gave away fifty percent of his income when he was in the apartment at the, at the retirement home, and so he didn't qualify. Children had to pay for his care, and so that's why people need to have somebody to know what's going on. And not to not plan on. I've had people came come in and say, Sarah, I want to give all my money away because I want to I, I want to be on Medicaid. Well, you want to go to the home that you want to go to if you have to go. Right. You want to make it sure it's not a place where it, that you don't want to your enemy to go to. Right. Yeah. And so they're looking at and, and just as a it's sort of like a guideline. Most nursing facilities, retirement communities. When you, um, if you're in the hospital or you're looking to go, they're going to be looking to see if you have at least 250 to $300,000 for usually each person. Because what they're doing is they're gonna make a calculated risk based upon, okay, what's the average? How long do people, are they healthy before we would end up going to skilled care? So if you try to plan and give away, the less money you have when it's time to find a nursing home, the fewer options you're going to have because nursing homes do not have to accept you as a Medicaid patient. Um, if you're not gonna qualify for Medicaid, they're not gonna accept you. And they only have so many Medicaid beds that they allot because some other, some other residents may run out of money and may need it. So just because you don't have a lot of money doesn't mean that you're not a candidate for certain nursing homes because depending on the time of the year, they may have what they say is a Medicaid bed available. It's called a certificate of need and Harrisburg gives the number of beds, Medicaid beds yeah. that there are throughout the county. Very, very interesting. And that's why Garden Plot bought Maple Farms nursing home. They needed their beds for their Medicaid patients. They didn't have enough at Garden Spot because the people were living longer and being in care longer. So they had to buy Maple Farm. Well, they didn't have to buy Maple Farm. They bought a facility that gave them more beds for Medicaid. I thought that was a brilliant move. So the long and the short of it is paying for long-term health care and nursing care um, is a complex, um, complex project. The sooner you begin planning, the, the more options you're going to have available to you. There's still crisis planning and there still are options, but they're more limited. So, um, and when you're meeting with uh, me or another attorney to talk about long-term care planning, we want everything, all of your information, because you might not think that something's important, but it really could. And there are rules with regard to life insurance and different types of assets that I'm not going to get into right now, but it's just complex. And so, um, you know, and I just often say like my first conference with clients about this, um, you know, someone's have to check, are the eyes glazed over? Do they understand what I'm saying? Because I know at the end of a conference with a client, I'm exhausted. I can't imagine the poor client who I just gave all of that information to. So planning sooner is better. And there might not be a whole lot you can do right now, but at least you know when, if this happens, that's what I should be looking out for. Not so after you're in the home. Yeah. Uh, also, oh, right. has, 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 this, is, this is really <laughs> trying important. to move us ahead. <laughs> that I just tried, is that if you remarry, a, a prenuptial agreement doesn't that you can't stop not paying for spouse nursing care. So if I marry somebody, I always jokingly say somebody has to have forty million dollars because I want to own the remote control before I remarry. But the um, but I will have to make sure that my spouse has either long term care insurance or that I'm willing to pay for it if he doesn't have any money. Okay. And just getting a divorce is not always the way out because there are Medicaid divorces, but if you divorce too late in the process, it doesn't matter because then they're going to be looking at, well, what did you settle? And the government, just remember this, the government has deep pockets. Mm -hmm. They can litigate this to the moon and back. So um, with regard to long-term care planning, it, it is a complex thing. Um, and so there are so many little different details that people can have that it's not necessarily universal other than the fact that it can be very complex. Okay. Now, <laughs> who, asked, who asked the question?
the question about contributions, qualified or non-qualified. Do you remember? Okay. That was you, Amy. Okay, could you repeat that question? I was just wondering, is there, are there more advocates? I wanted to make a guess for charitable organizations. Are there more <coughs> advantageous ways to do this? I know earlier we talked about being back in front of the RMD, so we know how to do that. Are there other, even outside of the retirement plan, more advantageous ways to get to charities? Okay. That there would be to right. help their tax situation and their income situation. So Amy's question was, um, what are the the ways to give to a charity that are beneficial? We already discussed that um, you can have a charity be a beneficiary of your IRA um, and it would go to the charity and the charity wouldn't have to pay any tax. That's certainly, and we also discussed required minimum distributions. Once you're 70 and a half can go directly to a charity and then you don't have to pay income tax um, on it. There are also uh, charitable gift annuities where you um, make a contribution to the gift annuity for the hospice, for example, and um, they will quote you a payment that they will pay you the rest of your life. And then when you pass, the remainder of that gift goes to hospice. Um, and there are other types of trusts that we can, uh, that are much more detailed to get into to have um, a charity be a beneficiary of as well. And um, Sarah mentioned that the standard deduction is so high now, just making normal contributions like we may have done in the past to charities aren't deductible, or at least they don't seem like they're deductible because we can't deduct them separately from the standard deduction. And there is something called um, a donor advised fund that you can um, open uh, an account, the donor advised account and contribute. Usually there's a minimum I know um, at Morgan Stanley, the minimum is 25,000. You contribute that into the donor advised fund in one year and you get the deduction, the tax deduction that year. But you have um, the flexibility to contribute to the charities that you want to contribute to over many years. You don't have to contribute the whole 25,000. And what we see clients doing is making that contribution and then, uh, you know, just continuing the way they've been contributing to their church or to hospice or to, you know, any other charity. And then maybe do that, um, and it doesn't have to be 25000 after the initial, but maybe every three or five years, make a lump sum contribution to the donor advised fund to get the tax deduction. And then, again, distribute it when you want over the Call next bunching, several years. Bunching your contributions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a Zoom attendee who is asking um, what your experience has been with someone in a community, a retirement community. Um, and th would that contract allow for them to make normal gifts to charities or churches? Um, if that has been their practice through their life? It really is going to depend. I mean, you have to check with the facility because if you run out of money, the facility is going to want to see what have you done with your money okay. uh, over those last however many years. Um, I know for Medicaid purposes, if you are on Medicaid or during the Medicaid look back, there is an exemption for Medicaid purposes, not necessarily for the nursing home purposes, but for Medicaid, that you can make total gifts each month not to exceed $500. If it exceeds $500, the total amount comes in and is added to your penalty. But if you keep all gifts, that includes to your church, to your grandchildren, to everybody, if it's $500 or less, then they don't count it toward that penalty period. But if you go over $500 in any one month, the entire amount gifted that month gets added to what's subject to penalty. So um, unfortunately, you know, Technically, reading a lot of those contracts, you got to be careful with what you're giving and how much money do you have left and what are the circumstances under which you're giving away money. And mm -hmm. that qualifies. it's only if, if there's a possibility that you could run out of money. Mm -hmm. If you have it um, in your financial plan, your gifting strategy, and you know your asset level is enough that uh, the chances are very slim that you're you know going to run out of money, you certainly can do it. 
with your money what right. you wish. That's good. And once somebody is below, uh, younger than the 70, uh, 70 and a half area, I like to give appreciated stock. Particularly now we've had a, an unbelievable run in the stock market since 08. And so I look at people's portfolio. It's one thing when um, Tim was talking about selling your house for a dollar to your child. What you're doing, the basis follows. The cost of the house follows to your child. Anytime you gift, if I gift IBM to my children, what I paid for IBM is what the basis is. Mm -hmm. Then when my children sell it, they have to pay the capital gain. Mm -hmm. But if you give it to a charity, so I paid $100 for Amazon, it's now $3,000. That gain, if I sell it, I pay for it. If I gift it to my children, they'll pay the tax on it. But if you give it to hospice, they don't pay any income tax on it. So I love to give appreciated stock. Mm -hmm. That means that basically nobody is paying for that, paying tax on that capital gain. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a lot of appreciated stock, that's certainly one place where you might want to look for, for charitable gifts. And there are no age restrictions. No. No. You can do that at 35, you can do it at, uh, you can't do it under 18, but you know, you can do it from the time you're 18 until you die. And uh, it's one of the things that a uh, tax package in Washington is talking about is that the cost basis doesn't jump up at death. Mm -hmm. They want to go to capital gains all the time, but I don't see how our whole, one of the most difficult things that Kelly and I have in life is what did people pay for things? Because they either got, a, you know, my, I have a client, he got Exxon from it, from a father. And he goes, well, I got that in 1964. And so that's his cost base. No, it's what his father paid for it in 1938. You know, mm -hmm. and so of course it's a large gain. So that's the kind of things I kind of look at it when um, I give away some Amazon stock. It only cost me eighty dollars to give away six thousand dollars, so it's really cool. It's really, <laughs> really cool. That's a really good point. Okay. Questions, anybody? Okay. Um, how about we talk about the trust? trust yeah. yeah. Well, I'll and just well, try to I'll try to let me touch on point. the basic uh, estate planning documents, and then we'll go into trust because it sort of segues in. So we did talk a little bit about the will that will decide what happens to your estate and your assets when you die, and also selects fiduciaries. Um, and the other two documents are powers of attorney that I recommend to all of my clients. The first one is a durable general power of attorney. And that is a document in which you name somebody to act as your agent who could take care of financial matters or matters of your estate, not your personal healthcare choices, everything else. Um, the power of attorney law has been changing in Pennsylvania, so it's important if you have an old power of attorney that you probably have it looked at and most likely updated just because there have been rules that changed. If you want your agent to have specific authorities, it has to be explicitly stated in the document. It's not just assumed that they have that authority. Um, powers of attorney can be effective immediately or they can be effective upon disability or incapacity, which is called springing. Um, and I like to do um, ones that are effective immediately simply because it can be used um, as a document of necessity or convenience. So, you know, picking your agent, somebody you trust, you can have professional uh, trust companies or banks who can serve as your agents as well. But just keep in mind when you're selecting a corporate fiduciary that there are going to be fees that are charged. Um, and so um, you've got that financial power of attorney and then a healthcare power of attorney. And in the healthcare power of attorney, the documents that I typically draft that are most in line with the Pennsylvania statute is that effective immediately, whoever's your agent, you've waived all the HIPAA privacy stuff. Your doctor can talk to your authorized person under that power of attorney um, without your consent, um, and you don't have to be incapacitated, okay? You're perfectly fine. I love that because my husband has not paid attention to anything the doctors say, so I'm usually <laughs> the one talking to the doctor, scheduling the appointments, and reminding him, you got to go get your eye and arm tested. <laughs> and so, not to, not to <clears throat> with, with the springing power of attorney, you have to get a letter from the doctor, right. and that's... And why do you want to do that? Right. And it's also more difficult now because, unfortunately, there are some people in my industry um, who like to litigate everything. So sometimes doctors are resistant to give that letter because they're afraid they're going to be on the hook if they say somebody's incapacitated. 
um, and it's later challenged because the agent ran away with money. So it's really important to somebody you trust. And um, and then with regard to the healthcare power of attorney, the ability for your agent to make healthcare decisions for you is only going to occur when you're incompetent. Now, incompetency can be bleeding. All it simply means is that you're unable to understand, make, or communicate a medical decision. So basically, if you can't give informed consent, then your agent can make healthcare decisions for you. So that is the healthcare power of attorney portion of it. Then also in that same document, I always recommend clients have a living will or an advanced healthcare directive. Now, if you have only a living will, you do not have a healthcare power of attorney, okay? It has to be a healthcare power of attorney and then it would have a living will in it. Now the living will portion, um, hopefully, you know, I have decided I'm going to live long and drop dead. But in case God has other plans for me, I've got the living will because I don't know, God forbid, I could have a terminal condition and not be able to make my own medical decisions. So while I have, well, we're not gonna talk about what my husband thinks, but while I have a good mind, I'll make my own decisions as to what I would or would not want in the event that at the end of my life, I am suffering, um, I have an end stage medical condition, which really kind of big terminal condition in your head, um, that death is going to occur regardless of any treatment, intervening treatment, mm -hmm. or I'm in a state of permanent unconsciousness. It's an irreversible coma, permanent vegetative state. It's not medically induced. It's not something that they think I'm gonna come out of. So my doctor has said that, has certified I'm either in that end stage medical condition or I'm in a state of permanent unconsciousness and I can't knowingly communicate my wishes. So you could be terminal, but you can still know what decisions you're making. Living will doesn't kick in, okay? Um, but if you can't communicate and you're in one of those two conditions, and there is no realistic hope for significant recovery. Then the living will kicks in. And if it's part of your healthcare power of attorney and you've named an agent, that agent is the contact person. So in that directive, you're saying whether or not you would want life-sustaining treatment, heroic measures. And do you want to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And actually, this, this is in your yeah. um, folder here. And I do, wishes. yeah, the five wishes. And I have it. Um, in the checklist, um, I do talk about the healthcare power of attorney with the living will, and I do list the heroic measures that are typically listed in the document. Now, if you're going to have a healthcare power of attorney, you could have the five wishes. It will stand alone. However, my recommendation is usually you have a healthcare power of attorney with a living will. And then you also have the five wishes to supplement it because the standalone healthcare power of attorney is not going to go into as much detail as to the type of care you would want in certain circumstances. It's much, much more personal. Now, if you only have the five wishes, that will still suffice. But lots of times, your healthcare personnel are going to want to know what are the decisions we have to make here, and they're not necessarily going to want to have to read a book. If there has to be somebody who's strong. I had a, a the power of attorney was in California. My client was in the hospital, and they just each day the doctor would do something more. So we I said she's 97 years old. She had a stroke on the opposite side of her body. This side is paralyzed. No, we don't want her. She can't possibly come out of this. But the uh, power of attorney had to say to the doctor, "I do not want anything more." And so you have to have somebody, you have to name somebody on here who isn't going to be weak and mean. Yeah. And say, oh my gosh. It's your advocate. It's your advocate. So you want somebody who's able to advocate for you. And when you're choosing that agent, you have to think about a couple of things because in the document, there is an option whether or not you would want your instructions to be mandatory or voluntary. Mandatory means that if you can't communicate your wishes, that whatever you have as instructions there, your agent must follow. If it's voluntary, you're saying it's guidance, but my agent has final say. So mm. when you're selecting your agent, you've got to think about a couple of things. Number one, will that person that you're naming try to make decisions that you would make if he or she was in that condition? Not what they would make, but would they try to put themselves in your shoes? 
Second would be, does that person have, I don't want to say, but backbone and the ability mm -hmm. to do it? Because if it's somebody you do trust, but you think that, oh my gosh, oh, they're not going to want to do this. Right. I use an example of my sister. I love her to death and she's not my agent, but if I had to name one of my sisters, I would have to make my instructions mandatory. Because if she told them to stop life support, even if there was no hope and I didn't want it, she would think she murdered me. So that's why I would make it mandatory in that case. Now, for my husband, whose document I prepared, and I am a little bit of a control freak, I told him that for his, he had to make them voluntary for me to make decisions for him because I can make those decisions and I don't want my hands to be tied, but I'm confident in my ability to do that, having to have done it for other family members. But you've got to think about those things when you're naming an agent. Not just your oldest child or not the, the child who's a nurse. Or my cousin who's a doctor or whatever right. you so, need to have somebody who has right and once again i want you to have your primary and at least one if not two alternates because unlike your financial power of attorney in the healthcare power of attorney if we if the doctors can't reach number one they're going straight to number two they can't reach okay. number two they're going to three if one's back in the picture we're going to whoever has the higher priority However, in a financial power of attorney, simply because your agent isn't available, they're not going to the next guy. Right. It's that first person, and they're only going to go to the next guy if the first person's died, the first person renounced or has resigned the position. Right. So because you're dealing with financial institutions, it's not back and forth. But with healthcare, healthcare decisions in an emergency situation can't wait to the next business day. So um, in, in my personal opinion, um, I have minor children still. So for me, the will is important because I can choose who's going to raise my kids. But when I'm looking at all of the documents, for me personally, I find the healthcare power of attorney almost one of the most crucial and personal because I'm deciding who gets to make medical decisions mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't have a financial power of attorney or a healthcare power of attorney, and God forbid I'm in a car accident, and I'm not able to take care of myself. I have suffered irreparable brain damage. My husband doesn't automatically get to do stuff for me because he's my husband. No, he would have to go to court and file a guardianship petition, have a doctor testify, have me drug into the courthouse, unless it's <laughs> not medically safe, so that there could be a hearing to determine whether or not I'm competent because you're taking someone's liberty away. Right. Whereas if you have that power of attorney, it's almost automatic. Like you hit the ground running. You don't have to wait for a judge to say, hey, and also the court doesn't oversee everything that goes on. I'm serving right now as a co-conservator for a person. He was a lawyer. He is a lawyer. Was a lawyer, I guess, now that he's in a dementia unit. But he did not have a power of attorney. And he had a will and so forth. So here, every year we have to make a, an accounting to the court of what we spent money on, et cetera, et cetera. It's a nightmare. And I, I just, I, I feel badly for the expense that his wife has to go through. And there are restrictions on what a, what a guardian or conservator can spend money on and what, whether it's income or principal, whereas if you've got your power of attorney and you've named someone you trust, they don't have to report to the court every year to say what you've done or ask the court for special approval. So let's talk about trust for a little bit. Okay, so there was a question about revocable versus irrevocable. And radical means you can change it. Irrevocable is you can set it up while you're living and not have it. So an example would be a charitable trust, maybe you set it up and you can't change it. And so it's, but you haven't died. So you have, and you can have a separate trust document. A lot of the, we were talking earlier about companies coming in and giving you a big binder and setting it up like that. You can do a trust, separate document separate during your lifetime. And I really recommend that when somebody has property in another state. Absolutely. So I'm a Pennsylvania resident, I have a home here, but if I had a beach property in Ocean City, New Jersey, I would certainly want to trust so that I don't have to probate a will in New Jersey if, uh, upon my death. So, and you can have a trust document outside. And I recommend that for a lot of clients, particularly those in California and Florida or you can have it inside your will. That's called a testamentary trust. So I have that set up maybe hopefully for grandchildren someday that I have it that if my children predecease me or a child predeceases me in my will, a trust is set up for my grandchildren. 
and what we call the trust that you set up during your lifetime that's not in your will. It's an inter vivos trust, meaning you're setting it up during your lifetime. So during your lifetime, you can set up the trust that's revocable or irrevocable. So when someone says, oh, I want a living trust, that is a revocable trust. Typically, living trusts are used as will, uh, will substitutes. So that, as Sarah was saying, if you do have real estate in New Jersey or another state, um, and Pennsylvania probate's not difficult, sometimes in other states, what we have to do then is get the records from Lancaster County to have them sent to another county in that state so that somebody can be authorized to then um, to convey or sell that real estate. So if you have real estate in another state, that's something that we wanna make sure we know about so that we can make different arrangements or discuss those arrangements with you. Um, and so um, even with that revocable trust, you can just put that, that real estate that's out of state in that revocable trust and everything else can just be as it is. It's just that we don't wanna to have to go through what we call ancillary probate in another state if we can avoid it. So if it's in a trust, the trustee, just keeps doing what they're doing and we don't have to worry about um, ancillary probate. There still might be death taxes, but that's going to be, if the real estate is in another state, Pennsylvania law does not tax it, okay? Real estate. So, you know, there are different rules. So if you do have real estate out of state, that's just something we would want to take a look at to determine what's going to work best for you. Um, now, a trustee is the most important person in the trust. It can be yourself during your lifetime. But you have to have to, or it can be a bank or a corporate trustee, as Kim, Kim was talking about earlier. But you need to have somebody who's willing to file a tax return if it becomes irrevocable, or you have to, have, which um, I have a lot of people we met on Friday. I met with clients, and the mother is going to set up a trust for her son, and it's not because um, they're not the ability to handle their own matters, it's because of the amount of death taxes involved. And so it'll be there for her children to enjoy their the income during their lifetime. But it's going to pass on to the grandchildren without being taxed again. And so there are lots of reasons, not just because it's revocable or irrevocable. In my business, we set up a lot of trusts because of the uh, wanting to save the 40% federal death taxes that it is once you get to the, and right now it's $11.65 million before you have to pay any federal estate tax unless you have other problems like giving away money during your lifetime. But they're talking about bringing it down to five million. That still sounds like a lot of money, but by the time you have your house and your IRAs and your life insurance in there, it doesn't take long to get near that amount. So, um, and, and just so you know some terms, when you're creating a trust, we have a trust instrument that could be a trust agreement or it could be called a deed of trust, which is kind of misleading because it's not a deed for real estate, but then the person who creates the trust, whether it be you, um, is the grantor or the set for, that's the person who creates the trust. Then there's the beneficiary. It could be somebody who receives income or they receive the principal. And then as Sarah said, the person who's going to hold those assets and control them for the benefit of another is the trustee. And so um, when Sarah was talking about the federal tax credit trust, those tend to be more testamentary. You have special terms in your will that provides for assets to go in a certain place. But we also have to make sure how are they titled so that they actually funnel into that trust. So um, while it's nice to have a whole lot more money, there are also more complicating tax factors that go with it. So you want to make sure that you know if you have a large estate, you might not just want a plain simple will. It would pay to get some advice and look over that and see because as I said, who wants to pay the government more money than you have to? Um, and um, with trust, um, there are those ones you create during your lifetime. They don't have to be just for your benefit. They could be for the benefit of another. It could be for your benefit and somebody else's benefit. But one of the things that um, I haven't mentioned, we haven't mentioned, is that when you're looking at who you want to receive your estate, it is important to take into account what that person's needs are. If you have a disabled grandchild who may be receiving government benefits, you're gonna to wanna to be very careful and you wanna to talk to, you might wanna to talk to that beneficiary's parents, find out what benefits are they receiving because while you might have good intentions, if you don't plan appropriately, 
those assets may go to their grandchild. They all have to be spent down. They're kicked off the government benefits. And those extra right. funds there that you had to provide extras aren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. So lots of times that's where we're talking about special needs or supplemental needs trust. That's its own creature um, that we can do a whole entire seminar on. But it's important that if you have beneficiaries that are disabled or have special considerations, that you talk about that, that we discuss it. Because in some instances, you know, with the first service designations for IRAs or 401ks, we might not want it to be first service because that disabled child's parent could die. They're going to get that money. And so we have to do special things and it's reallocating um, and what have you. But it is an important consideration that can be complicated. So you can't go to your real estate attorney to handle this. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that was my question. who specializes in Yeah, it. that was my question. Do uh, attorneys who specialize in this, how would they advertise themselves? Elder law or well, disability? Times, um, like because I practice in those areas, usually I say that I'm a state planning, a state and trust planning and administration attorney. So I can do simple stuff or complex stuff. Okay. Lots of times we'll talk about, you know, higher net worth, if that's something you specialize in. But usually um, elder law attorney uh, or somebody who deals with, uh, usually we, we say special needs trust. Special needs it is trust. A word. Um, and with elder law attorneys, there are certain designations that you can have as a certified elder law attorney. Um, it's just certification and registration. I'm not a certified elder law attorney, but I've been practicing elder law for, for, for a number of years Good. Uh, now. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, you just want to ask, do they have experience in that? Because there are some attorneys, um, old schools, like, oh, anybody could prepare a will. And I've had some colleagues who have prepared wills and transferred things. I'm like, oh my gosh, no, we can't do it this way. We have to undo it or fix it. So if you're dealing with more complicated things, it's important to inquire, you know, what areas have they practiced in? Because it's, and usually a bigger firm will have somebody who specializes in elder law compared to other things. But coming, I don't know, in terms of if you just kind of came to Sarah Fisher to prepare a will, then I wouldn't have the expertise. Expertise. One of the things we didn't talk about yet today was a lot of my clients will say, well, my estate is kind of complicated than doing it to nieces and nephews. So I'm going to make the estate my beneficiary of my IRA or my 403B or my 401k. What that does is put the entire amount of that IRA into uh, tax consequences. Mm -hmm. And when it's an estate, it doesn't take long to get to the maximum yeah. income tax bracket. So I don't care if you can do it on another document. You can say, uh, Schwab calls it a complex beneficiary. I just did it. It goes um, to eight different grandchildren. And so you don't have to put it on the form. Um, and I know attorneys are very uh, cautious and they want to make sure it's very correct. So they do it separately and then it can be changed easily by changing the, the word processing uh, document. But my point is, is that don't just name your estate because it's easy. Because you're, what you're doing is ca causing the tax, the Pennsylvania inheritance, tins, inheritance tax of four and a half or 15%, plus the income tax liability all at one time. So just think about this. When, when we're talking about retirement assets, if you've got a, a person, a human being person, you're going to have more favorable income tax options than you do if you're naming a non-human entity. Because... What Sarah was talking about rollovers for spouses or 10 years for non spousal beneficiaries. But if we're talking an estate or an entity other than a charity, we're looking at five years. So, and those income tax consequences that an estate suffers pass right through in most cases to the beneficiaries. So, it will reduce their bottom line. So, whenever we're talking retirement assets, usually the general rule is don't name your estate. Um, there are times that you can, depending on your beneficiaries, but as a general rule, you don't want to name your estate. So um, that's usually probably just the safest thing unless you talk to somebody about it, but that is a very good point. Maybe once a month, maybe once a quarter, I have to duke it out with somebody who wants to say, oh, I just want to name my estate. No, you don't. And, there, <laughs> and the um, IRAs can go into a trust, but it has to be a special trust. Again, you need to have uh, an attorney help you make sure the document we have to have special language in it and it's convoluted and when the secure act was passed two years ago 
that change, not just like the amount of time, but you know, if you have a minor beneficiary, if you have an adult beneficiary, what language do I have to have in the trust? Does it pass through? Does it get taxed in the trust? So there are lots of different things that we have to consider um, that I can't just give general advice, one size fits all. But it's, I think it's important for people to know, particularly if it's a large IRA, that you can do it, uh, have a beneficiary of the trust but it has to be a special document. Right, and that's why I said generally, you just don't do it unless you're talking to your professionals who can then walk you through. I'm just taking some notes and I missed a, a part there when you keep saying name in your estate. What does that mean? The beneficiary is, I would say the Sarah Fisher estate. That would be, the benefit. I don't want to do it and don't do it, but I'm saying that's what a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to go. I go five different ways. That's confused mess and so forth. So I'm just going to make my mistake because then it'll go out to my five children. Well, no, it, it does after I pay all the income okay. I pay all the income tax mm -hmm. on it. So that's why. So when, when you name your estate, it's basically then it's going to be liquidated for the most part and then just pay for treated as cash or whatever if it was if it was with one of your other probate assets. So um, <sighs> like usually anytime you're dealing with retirement assets, there are going to be income tax consequences that follow through. So you want to be careful with that and not name your estate unless you've spoken with uh, an attorney or your financial advisor to understand what those consequences right. are. And what has happened since the um, Dodd-Frank bill of 2008 came in, because somebody uh, accused me last week of trying to keep, keep the money with um, RKL Wealth Management, because we are obligated by law now, if when I die, my children are my heirs of my IRA. However, they still have to open up an account at Schwab for the money from my IRA to go to their IRA. Now, they can sell it out and take a cash. They can transfer it to their advisor or whatever. But I want everybody in the room to know that if your advisor isn't doing something wrong or your the benefit, the uh, person who dies, is the broker isn't doing anything wrong, they are obligated to set up an account so that the assets can flow through. They want to know where the money comes from. It's really Homeland Security set it up and is the law. So now I just had a person die with seven children and we had to set up seven IRAs for $180,000. But we did, and they were able to do, they either kept it with Schwab or they moved it elsewhere. But, and so I, it, that's just a new law that we have to deal with. And there are questions? Should you have both a will and a trust? I kept getting kind of confused in the language and the benefit. Whether you should have a will and or a trust. I would say everybody should have a will, even if it's a simple will, because you never know when there might be this asset that crops up that you don't know about. Now, with the trust, you're going to look at um, not everybody, and I'm actually not a big proponent of having a living trust for Pennsylvania. There are circumstances when it makes sense, but generally you don't need a living trust, um, which is um, so, but in your trust, in your will, you may have trust provisions. If you have minor beneficiaries, if you have special needs beneficiaries, you may want to put a trust provision in there because if you do not, the individual is entitled to that money when they reach age 18 for most intent purposes. So you may not, most people don't need a separate standing trust. I would say everybody needs a will. Your will could have trust provisions. And depending on what things you want to do, maybe you want to have a charitable remainder trust or charitable lead trust, other things that are a little more complicated, you may want that, but not everybody needs to have a trust. What we talked about with the binder, you know, that they can't mm -hmm. come door to door and sell, that is a living trust. And that is just avoiding probate as Kim said before that it's not a huge issue in Pennsylvania. The beneficiaries usually with the trust, if you have a living trust, the heirs will get the money faster than through an estate. But that doesn't mean you have to wait to the end of the estate. I just had a situation where it's about a million dollars going out to two children. And I felt comfortable in giving them an executor. I gave them each $250,000 initially. It's called an advanced distribution. And then I'll wait for the rest after we pay all the taxes, et cetera. So a trust is easier, faster to distribute. 
and there, but there's a possibility of more complications because sometimes people, when they have a trust, they're like, oh, well, we don't need the probate, we don't need an attorney, and then they start giving away money that they should not have given away. So I'm, if you don't have a very sophisticated client, I'm not a fan of, of living trusts. But yeah, they do get access to the money sooner. But in this day and age, most creditors know, all right, it's going to take you at least a month and a half till you get the, the will probated, till you get a bank account set up. So they know to wait. So when I have people like, oh, well, we need to be able to pay for this, this, and this right away. No, they can wait. Um, so there's not that rush. And I personally funeral director, they can wait. <laughs> yeah, they can. Yes. yes. And my, my thought is that if it is in, because everything I have to do to help administer a trust, if I have to do to administer an estate, I have to do almost everything the same for a trust. So you're not saving on the administrative end. And getting the money a little sooner can be a double-edged sword. So um, I just personally prefer that we just probate. Even if there is a living trust, I still recommend that we probate depending on the assets because it's just... It's good to have that so if that thing pops up, we've got it. Um, but and the executor is responsible for paying the, right. the inheritance tax in Pennsylvania, right. unless the will says otherwise. But you, so you want to keep the money handy if you need it to pay an inheritance tax. Right. Right? And then if you're doing the living trust, you want your trustee and executors to be the same people for same entity. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. If anyone has um, a question here at the end and we'll wrap up. Is there a, a discount if the taxes are paid within 90 days? Right. We typically do have a seminar that's on estate administration or even just inheritance taxes because that in and of itself is a complex subject. But when an individual dies, an inheritance tax return and inheritance tax return must be filed within nine months and taxes paid within that nine months from the date of death. Otherwise, interest begins to accrue. You can ask for an extension to file an inheritance tax return. However, there is a three month discount. They call it a discount. It just depends on how you look at it. But basically, if during the first three months following the date of death, not the date of probate, but the date of death, there is a payment made on or toward the inheritance tax. Whatever amount was paid, you get an additional five credit, five percent credit. So if I paid hundred dollars in the first three months toward my final bill, I get credited hundred five dollars basically. So if I pay a thousand, then it is um, one thousand fifty dollars. So what you're looking at is if you make a payment during that first three months. You get an additional credit. They say it's a discount, but I think it's sort of like glass half full, half empty kind of thing. So if you pay during the first three months, you get extra toward you, you're said to have paid more than it, five percent of what you paid toward your final bill. And in some estates, because lots of things are subject to tax that you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily assume, you can save thousands of dollars by pay, making a prepayment. So that's something we always look at right away. Like, what do we think the assets are? While well, we might not have everything guaranteed. We're trying to estimate, right, these are the expenses or the debts that we know about. Let's try to make that prepayment because it can save money. And as sort of, you know, you because it's on the situation, 5% was $50,000. Mm -hmm. And it was a big deal to get it in. And with the courthouse closed down last year, it's just been a nightmare to get your authorization within three months. Oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody. Any other and questions? Thank you. I think then. Um, you would go from here knowing that you need a team of people working for you. Often we'll have a CPA um, on the panel with us, but um, know that we all work with each other. I can't um, possibly, Sarah, I can't possibly do what Kim does and Kim- um, I do not do, do what, what we do. <laughs> do, do and uh, we don't, uh, for the most part, prepare tax returns. So we all talk with, um, each other, you know, at your um, uh, guidance and authorization uh, to help you through all these difficult questions. Is there typically a CPA that you usually have with you and utilize, like 
a person's name. Well, we would certainly have accountants and attorneys and him vice and versa. Upon, that like the with. issues in their area of expertise okay. and the personality. Yeah, it's not. I was just curious. Yeah, not, yeah, I was it's, just curious. it's kind of nothing one size fits all. So usually we try to personalize it because there might be yeah. accountants whose personalities just won't mix with this client. So, but we do have a list that we regularly and use. And my firm does do taxes. The thing okay. is, the thing is, is that there's a minimum fee. You know, type of thing. So you don't. I wouldn't recommend RKL if you have a two hundred fifty dollar tax return. You want one that's right. more more complicated. Right. And so there are lots of fine CPAs who have their own firm, and I shall be glad to guide you to, to one. But uh, it is not an RKL firm. Any other questions online? No one's coming. Okay, ladies. Thank you so much for your attention today, and please uh, join me in thanking our presenters today. Yeah. As Kim mentioned earlier, you are going to receive a survey that's going to come online from SurveyMonkey um, at, at the first of next week. So if you could please fill that out, and it has an opportunity to also include things that you'd like to see in the future or things we didn't get to talk about today. Um, remember, inside your packet, we have contact information for all of these ladies. Uh, should you need additional professional services, you're certainly, um, this, that would certainly be something that hospice would recommend to, that's who we reach out to, are these professionals, so if that gives you uh, any thought. I also just wanted to share with you quickly before you go, um, in your packet, you have a newsletter called the Snapshot Newsletter. And that is for a program um, that's really important here. And I know Kelly referenced it today in um, most of the, the panels on the Women's Giving Circle as well. This is a group of ladies who are just passionate about philanthropy. And I know many of you in this room are members as well. I see some face smiling back at me. Um, but this is our, our Women's Giving Circle. And this is a group of women who are passionate about philanthropy, um, but also passionate about where their dollars are going. So what the Women's Giving Circle does is each member pays a $500 annual, makes a $500 annual gift to hospice. But instead of just making that gift to hospice and saying, you know, thank you and put that wherever you think it's needed most, um, we have a program throughout the year and we actually ask hospice staff to provide grant requests for things that would make the care that they give to patients and families better or may make their job easier, more streamlined. So last year, those women pulled their funds together. Last year, we funded $82,000 worth of projects for hospice staff. So you can see the huge impact that that makes. And coming up next week on October 14th, that's this coming Thursday at 4 p.m. right here in this room and on Zoom, we're going to be having our staff come and share all of the needs that they have. If that is something that you have interest in, um, please contact me. I would love to talk to you more about that. We're always looking for women to join this great group to help us make an even larger impact. My name is Amy Lewis and my card is in your packet. Any other questions, comments, concerns for today? Right, thank you so much for your attention and your time. Have a great day. Thank you.